Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're going to give it just another couple minutes while people get through the security desk out front. So we'll be starting the meeting in about two minutes. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Joint Working Group and Science Coordination Group meeting. I think we've got just about everybody in here. There may be a few public representatives and a few folks around the table still coming through security. So we'll get started while that's happening. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending this morning. And by way of introduction, James Erskine. Chairman of the group and Everglades coordinator for the South Florida, excuse me, um, the <laughs> I was going to say the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force again there and announce the meeting. Uh, and Everglades coordinator for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, I'd like to recognize our co chairs at the table here today, and I'll go right down to my left. Uh, Bob Johnson, National Park Service Chair of the Science Coordination Group. Nick Allman, USGS, and Vice Chair of the Working Group. Susan Gray, South Florida Water Management District, and Vice Chair of the Science Coordination Group, and Short Timer. <laughs> <laughs> and why don't we go right ahead and go around the table for a quick whip around, and we'll start right to our left. Good morning. This is, uh, I'm Edward Smith. I'm with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I'm the Working Group Representative for DEP. Good morning, Amy Castaneda, representative for the Miccosukee Tribe. Uh, good morning, Kevin Kniff. I am the working group uh, representative for the Seminole Tribe. Good morning, good morning uh, Stacy Myers, uh, with the uh, work Seminole <laughs> the Science Coordination Group, Seminole Tribe of Florida. Good morning, Deborah Drum, Palm Beach County Environmental Resources Management. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Chad Kennedy with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and I'm our representative on the Science Coordination Group. Uh, Brian Benscoder, Florida Atlantic University, here for John Baldwin, uh, also Florida Atlantic University on the Science Coordination Group. Good morning. Howie Gonzalez with the Corps of Engineers, representing Colonel Andrew Kelly, who sends his uh, regrets for not being able to make it today. Thanks. Good morning, Veronica Harold James with the U.S. Attorney's Office here in representation for the Department of Justice. Good morning, I'm James Evans, Director of Natural Resources for the City of Sanibel and the Science Coordination Group. Good morning, Cecilia Harper, EPA liaison to the Corps for SERP and a working group member. Rebecca Elliott, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services on the working group. There we go. Now it's on. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Rudnick, Science Coordinator at Everglades National Park, uh, on the Science Coordination Group, acting as Special Advisor to the Department of Interior. Thank you. 
Angie Dunn, Corps of Engineers, Jacksonville District, Science Coordination Group member. Good morning, Marjorie Kirby, Florida Department of Transportation Working Group. Good morning, I'm Bob Pergolsky, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I'm representing both Larry Williams on the, as a working group member. He's out of town this week, and myself on the Science Coordination Group. Good morning, everybody. Pedro Ramos with the National Park Service. Chris Kelbel uh, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and I'm on the Science Coordination Group. Penny Hall, FWC, representing Gil McRae. Good morning. Jennifer Leeds with the South Florida Water Management District, uh, representing the working group. Thank you. Go ahead, there you go. Good morning, everybody. Adam Gelber, uh, Department of the Interior. Um, I wanted to take a, a minute here. Um, I really appreciate everybody's time to come to the meeting this morning. Um, I, I got the opportunity in a hall pass to go to the park this past weekend and spend some time in the bay. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's struggling a little bit right now, but all in all, the place is unbelievable. Um, it, it always, I've been going there for close to 30 years, and the place um, is full of life right now. And it, it, it always reminds me of the importance of you all here at this table that are the boots of the ground that are generating the science and helping with the policy in order to move this program forward. And this is really where we have an opportunity and a voice to, to the management and the leadership um, that is in the decision-making policy and science level in order to push those through and, and reflects back again on the importance of you all being here at this table. And today's agenda, you know, is going to demand, you know, some, some rigosity, some, some uh, fearless leadership and, and, and open dialogue um, to, to make this an effective group um, moving forward. So thanks for your time. And, and James, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for the encouraging words. Um, just as a few housekeeping notes before we get started here, I think most of us have met in this room before, but I will just remind everybody that the whole meeting is being webcast and use our microphones clearly as we did on that introductions. Uh, there will be two opportunities for our folks in the, in the, in the audience today and the public. There will be two opportunities for public comments. And if anyone would like to speak during that public comment period, please fill out a card and provide it to our staff over here at, uh, at OERI. And note the relevant agenda item that you would like to speak on so we can tie that in appropriately. Adam, thank you for kind of kicking us off. I'd just like to, we've done an introduction, but I'd like to just allow any of the members on, on that whip around. We went through with the introductions, but if anyone would like to add some introductory remarks for the day, or if anyone would like to add an announcement for their day, I'd open the floor to that. And, Quiet group. Adam, I'll hand it off to you. I think we need to make a, a special announcement today. Hmm? Yes, thanks, James. So um, at this time, uh, we, uh, and as I spend my first year, sorry, as I spend my first year uh, having just passed that milestone, um, you know, I continue to learn more about you know, the Everglades. I expect that over my hopefully long career or my career, I will continue to learn uh, more and more about the Everglades from many folks that are sitting here at this table. And, um, you know, at times we have folks that, you know, have dedicated their entire life, you know, to South Florida, to the ecosystem, to the stakeholders, have given of not only their, their personal um, not only of their technical abilities that they've crafted over a career, but their personal investments. I see it all around this table of people going beyond, you know, it just being a job. And, um, you know, we, we're here take, going to take a little bit of time to, you know, celebrate uh, Dr. Gray's accomplishments since 1992 of working in the system and um, taking a moment to, to reflect back um, on, on a long career of being available, accountable, 
you know, in a leadership position here with one of the largest water resource agencies this country has um, and what that takes and the dedication to achieve success and continuing to move forward um, in, in restoration specifically and more supporting, you know, this group and, and the task force and, you know, others that she has mentored through her career and um, just taking a moment here to, you know, call out the attention and make sure that everybody's aware that this will be Susan's, Dr. Gray's, excuse me, um, you know, last um, uh, joint meeting, I believe. Um, but, um, and she may have to go through some withdrawals for a while. And we hope that, you know, she may be able to find a place to continue to bring, you know, that, that historical knowledge that has gained over a career since 92. Um, of, of working in this resource. So, you know, on behalf of uh, Secretary Bernhardt, uh, we'd like to present you with the, uh, with the chair's coin. I'll keep it short. <laughs> but thank you, everyone. And I know so many of you in this room and have for years, and you probably can't hear me. Um, and that's, that I'm gonna miss, that day-to-day -day interaction. Um, the, the science that we do is next to, next to none in terms of complexity and challenges and uniqueness. And so just carry forth. It's an amazing opportunity for everybody who's here now and everybody coming up behind us. Um, when I came to the Water Management District and I didn't think I would stay that long, I think they chained me to my desk. But um, I appreciate y'all and that's really gonna be the hard part about going. But on the flip side, I'm looking to have some fun. Doing something completely different, so. Thank you everybody. And she's not getting off that easily. Uh, she found out I was going to make some remarks, and I think she has been a little worried about that. Uh, I, I really have treasured being a friend of Susan's and being a professional colleague for a long time. She came to the district in 1992, right after I did. And uh, we worked in a lot of the same areas, and I really valued her input and, and being able to talk to her about things over all that time. So she's retiring January 8th with uh, pushing 28 years with the Water Management District but she had a storied career even before that. Uh, from California, she worked uh, after, uh, while going to school, worked at the California Academy of Sciences and then came to Florida to get her PhD at Florida State. We just, yeah, we, I'll just let that, however that goes. And uh, then worked for DEP from 80, uh, 85 through 88, and then four years with a consulting firm, uh, Dames and Moore back then, and then uh, I know a great story before she came to the district, one of the, when she was still pretty new in that job, she got to run a very, very divisive and uh, controversial public meeting in, in her role for that consulting firm. And I sort of, I think of those uh, instances as kind of trial by fire when you get thrown into people screaming at you and yelling at you. And she mentioned she had just had her child and was not in the mood to be uh, bounced around by a lot of other people, so maybe it was a tough time for them to take her on at that point. I don't know, um, but I, apparently that went well. And then you know came to the district and worked on. A, she's been in a variety of positions here. Currently, she's retiring as the bureau chief of applied sciences, and, uh, and overseeing a great bunch of people. And I know they've enjoyed having her, and I know she's been very appreciative of all the good people that have worked for her here at the district and all of her colleagues. That's I know that's meant a lot to her. So we'll wish her off for a really, very nice uh, retirement. And uh, I think there are two family members that are very happy about her decision, Jim, her husband, and Caitlin, her daughter. And uh, if you need any good artwork, Caitlin is very good <laughs> at that and may help support Susan in her retirement. So be sure. So again, we're gonna miss you. I was say uh, if anybody else wanted to say something. I, I, I can't. Oh, no. I can't let this pass. <laughs> Just uh, and maybe Deb Trump can chime in. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, I don't want to take up time at this meeting, but um, Su Susan and, and I and Nick um, and Fred Scar and Deb Drum, uh, we've spent we spent years and years working together, 
um, walk into Susan's office um, and uh, trying to, to vent my frustration and just see she's uh, cuddling with her pottery, going like this. This sa- keeps me sane. <laughs> because, because he would show up in my office at like five thirty-six, yes. when I'm trying to like pack up and get out the door, <laughs> and he would just sit down, and that would go another hour. <laughs> but um, w- w- when I left, I, I know Fred Fred Scar was w- f- filled filled that role uh, plenty. <laughs> he was staying late and and discussing emails that weren't completely read and. Mis- misunderstood, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I want to reflect back though just one one component of you know the days in um, well one in recover how important your your work was in leadership of recover, and in the Okeechobee division um, in the early days and I, I think back at how you know what a great group that was with uh, Carl Havens um, at that time and um, having just to come back from Gainesville not Tallahassee uh, from a C Grant meeting. Uh, where Carl was honored, uh, and I was, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, your group then, and just, uh, you know, the great work that, that was done that kind of laid the groundwork for where we are today. So, and Nick, you were part of that too. But Susan, you, you deserve great credit for that. So, thank you. Susan, you deserve so much recognition for all that you've contributed to this agency and to South Florida Everglades Restoration, and we are all so grateful. And I just want to say, I know I don't speak just for myself, of all the number of people that you've touched with all of your knowledge and all that we've learned from you and the example that you set for us. And we had some really, really challenging issues that we all worked together, and I learned more Um, really working at the Water Management District about teamwork and how people come together through tough times. And you were in the room for so many of those times. So really appreciate it. And uh, always remember all the laughter. We had some good times as well. So thank you for all that that you've done and really wish you well and a well-deserved retirement. Thank you. So Susan, I want to thank you for your tremendous contributions to Everglades Restoration. I mean, You've always been that person I could pick up the phone and talk to about whether it's Everglades issues, Lake Okeechobee, the estuaries. You know, you've always been there. Um, I I know you always give it to me straight, and I really appreciate that. And uh, I just was hoping that we could get another round of adaptive protocols before you left. But uh, (laughs) anyway, you will be missed, so thank you. That's one project I won't miss. (laughs) Susan. Very grateful for your service over so many years. And, you know, regarding this business of withdrawals, you know, whatever that might be, uh, I hear that you may get it. uh, It may last a day or two. (laughs) And if it lasts longer than that, I want you to know that we've got four amazing National Park Service units down here. And we've got just the right volunteer uniform for you. Thank you for your service. Susan, on a personal note, thank you for everything that you've helped me with along the years, both within this group, within your agency, and within the, more importantly, within the science of the system. So thank you so much. From here. Um, yep. Susan? Um, Yeah, just again, thank you for being there for so many touching base conversations, looking into things. You're always accessible, always helpful, and I will miss seeing you in the hallways and being able to catch up. So hopefully you'll visit sometime. (laughs) To put it bluntly. We'll recognize folks in the audience as well for this. I didn't know if I could crash the party, but Susan, I I, I really appreciated uh, Susan's friendship and leadership when we were working on the adaptive assessment team together and all of the things that you have done then and since then in terms of Everglades restoration. But most importantly, Susan and Caitlin have the record for the number of alligators counted at Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. Hey Susan, Um, 
people might not know, but we go back to Dames and Moore. So it's been a long, long time. I've really enjoyed personally working with you. You've been one of my mentors in my career, and um, really appreciate that. And also, all the work you did on Lake Okeechobee, the, the contributions that's given to the Corps of Engineers to help us on how we operate the lake. It's just you and Carl Havens started that to bring the ecology into how we operate the lake. So we can't thank you enough for that. All right. Thank you, everybody. And, and Susan, again, thank you very much. From here, I think we'll take into our first agenda item, which is the director's report on our task force meeting. Thank you, James. Um, in reflecting back <clears throat> on the task force meeting, um, I'm not sure how many of you, uh, some of you were in attendance at the meeting. Maybe some have viewed it uh, online. Uh, we're watching it online while it was happening up in, up in Washington. Um, Assistant Secretary of Water and Science, Dr. Petty, remains completely engaged since then. He's asking for briefings every couple of weeks on how progress is being made on the ground here based on those directives um, and is um, a, a real, uh, it's, it's real fresh uh, to have that kind of engagement uh, from Washington um, in, in my one year of being here uh, with all the transitions that were going on over this one year. Um, I'd like to also just reflect for a minute back that, that um, you know, I, uh, over this last year of my, my being here, I have learned a tremendous amount. And where that's led to me to believe is, is that we're like on that first step. We've got the foundation built, those folks that developed the framework for restoration. We, we've got that foundation and taking that first step up the stairway to get up to that second floor, that top floor, is we're right there. We are so close. You know, based on what I've learned over this last year, is um, really, really uh, hopeful um, of, of where we we have yet to go, um, and and hopefully with Dr. Petty's leadership in the near term, we'll be able to, along with uh, Vice Chair uh, the Secretary Valenstein as well, um, at the helm um, and their directives that they had provided from the task force meeting, um, those being you know continuing to work on work and and really really working on that very hard, um, which, which has gone on, um, which has taken place uh, as we speak. Um, the, also requests for integrated delivery schedule, which we'll be getting into later today, uh, one of the main topics for this afternoon, and I hope you all have plans to spend here because we need your feedback. Uh, the task force needs um, that, that, that direction um, in response to address uh, at the senior leadership um, locations. Uh, also, one of the other items that we'll be discussing, if you haven't had a chance to look at the agenda, is uh, obstacles that we face. Also, we might be able to bring benefits. That's going to take a lot of work of this group as well to really get, um, be fearful, uh, fear, sorry, not fearful, fearless. Excuse me for that. Um, fearless, yes, let me, let me repeat that. Be fearless this afternoon in, in, in talking about those obstacles because that's, that's tough. That's the tough work that we have to do um, in order to continue to reach those next um, levels of restoration um, to work through some of those issues that are here. Um, we're still working on the next dates. Um, the OERI is uh, for that um, next meeting. We're, we're looking at uh, trying to focus on uh, April 21st, 22nd, or sometime during the first week of May uh, for the next task force meeting. Um, so. That is generally the overview of what happened at task force meeting. Um, and we appreciated all of the public support that was there and the public comments uh, that were provided to support the, the task force engagement. And I look forward to Dr. Petty's uh, continued uh, guidance and engagement. Um, if there's any questions um, regarding that, I'd be happy to take them, but that's the brief report. Thank you, Adam. Adam, if I may, I'll add to it. Uh, the meeting was very well attended in the audience, but after the meeting, we were in D.C., and I, um, some of the partners that are supportive of Everglades Restoration and some of the agency staff did take the time to meet with some of the federal representatives, and I myself met with a number of federal representatives while I was up there uh, with our partners, and I found the message for funding for Everglades Restoration 
and I found support for funding it, support for Everglades restoration to be very well received by the members I met with, and that's good. It's good to see that, and it's good to see that bipartisan support in Congress. Mm. Just looking around the table to see if there was any comments on the task force meeting from our group. Okay, we'll go up to agenda item number three. It's the working group and science coordination group priorities update from Alan Childress. Alan, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay, fantastic. I am here in my bulky sweater representing all Floridians on this cold winter's day. We have to break it out when we can. All right, I'm gonna be talking to you about the priorities that we started work on last year around this time. We had a good brainstorming session where we generated a lot of ideas, and we have more than what I'm talking about being tackled right now, but these are the two most intensive efforts that our office is engaged in with you, our members, and those are the system-wide ecological indicators and our invasive exotic species um, effort. And we provided an update that to the task force at their most recent meeting to keep them apprised of what we're working on. As a reminder, we had established the system-wide ecological indicators as a way to look at the overall ecosystem health and response to restoration. We looked at this suite to be able to cover a variety of issues based upon the, the time and the space within the ecosystem that we were, we were looking at. So those have been chosen, they've been established for a while now, and we have a section related to them in our biennial report that goes to Congress. They also have their own more lengthy standalone report that has a lot more information for those who want to delve into the science and technical pieces of it. But what we wanted to do at this opportunity is to take a look at this list of indicators and try to figure out if they're portraying helpful, useful, correct information going forward from here on out. And if there's stumbling blocks in the way of being able to monitor and look at specific pieces, you know, how can we make this most useful for everyone looking at the information? And so we're going to be doing this. It's going to be a lengthy process. This is not a quick thing because we have to look at several levels of information on these. And we're looking at incorporating that into our 2022 biennial report. And before we start tackling the technical pieces of the indicators themselves, we wanted to make sure we spoke with the decision makers, the policy makers of this body and trying to find out, is the information helpful to you? Are you aware of it? Are you using it? Is there a way we can do better for you with these indicators? And we have um, my wonderful partner in crime on this is Laura Brandt in the back row. And we have started the interview process where we're going to be speaking with some of you, some of your next level up in your organizations as well, trying to get that feedback on the utility of this document and making sure we're providing a useful product for them. So that is the process that we're um, working on now. And we're going to bring that information back to you at your next meeting in February. So the SCG will have a chance to discuss, and the working group as well, to discuss the information gleaned from those interviews because I think that will be very informative to the process moving forward. So we're doing the interviews now. We'll come back and speak with you all February 25th. And then we'll be tackling some more of those technical bits. And uh, um, Nick Amon and his crew at USGS are going to help with that process as far as the logistics. He's able to provide some resources for that. Bob Johnson will be leading some of the technical discussions and moving that forward with a time frame of looking at beginning that technical discussion in spring of this year in April we're looking at to work on that. And Nick and Bob, do you have, or Laura, do you have any additional comments you'd like to provide on what I just provided as a very brief summary? Nick is good. Laura's good. Bob uh, is let, not good. Let me start <laughs> and just say, <clears throat> for us to have a workshop in April, we need a steering committee mm -hmm. starting like January. Oh, good. So think about that uh, as we go forward and which agencies think you really need to be engaged in this. And we're asking for staff commitment to work on that. So I think that's the key thing by February we have to have a good start yes we'll be working and using a lot of your knowledge so everybody be prepared for this Adam you had something to add 
Yes, thank you. I, I think that um, in, in working up to this, in the, in the run up to it, I think Laura wanted to speak with everybody here at the table, um, but, but that's just not feasible. And, um, you know, those that are engaged in the broad spectrum to cover all as much of a broad cast net as possible, um, any of those that are uh, in need of support or information in advance of your um, in, in advance of your meetings, please reach out to myself or anybody on the OERI team to help you, you know, better understand or prepare for for this process. That is, uh, it's important that we 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 have a uh, a review at this time and the the effort. Um, thank you, Laura, uh, for for taking this on, um, and, and the commitment that it takes, as well as you, Alan. Um, but uh, thank you in advance. Just a quick note. Thank you, Adam. All right. And there's the contact information for Laura and myself if you need it. And the next major topic that is underway is looking at our invasive exotic species framework document. We have a strategic action framework that many of you helped us generate and, and develop starting back in 2013. So that document has been finalized as of 2015. And we were looking at freshening it up, making sure we're portraying current challenges and recent successes, new partnerships, things that are being achieved even since 2015. There's been a lot of movement and support and efforts underway on invasive exotic species from many of your agencies. So we've been looking at the document. This is just one simple graphic. I apologize, it's a little small to read, but we have established goals related to every phase of the invasion curve prevention, EDRR, early detection and rapid response for er eradication, containment, and then the long-term management part. So that's the structure of this document. We're not looking at overhauling everything because the structure is quite good. Again, we just want to be able to update it and make the information useful for everyone. And we're looking to update that by this summer, tying in again with um, the other documents we have underway. So we have had some phone calls with members of your agencies and experts looking at these issues. We've all had agreement on the, can keeping the basic structure and the four goals. And we're looking at in incorporating new information, especially in the prevention section. There's some new documents that have come out from the Western Governors Association, other sources that we might be able to beef up that area and look at new ways of prevention across the country that we can look at involving here. The case studies that we have, we have case studies for each phase of the invasion curve. And we did that last time mainly species by species. So we have one on lionfish, we have one on Malaluca, things of that nature. We had a very good discussion on the phone with the, with the crew that's working on this, talking about instead of being so species specific, let's look at that programmatic level that could apply to more species. How are your agencies tackling this phase, this effort? What, if there is reptiles, it could apply to more than just one. So we're looking at revamping those a bit and making sure we're showing what is currently underway and the efforts y'all are undertaking on invasive exotic species. And also, again, the partnerships that we're looking at that have been very effective in, in the recent years. So that's where we're now at, and we're going to next be tackling the, um, <clears throat> the preliminary action assessment that we conducted back in 2015 that showed a lot of pieces, mainly in the EDRR section of the efforts, things that we wanted to tackle very soon and prioritize as a collective group, individual agencies as well. There's been a lot of progress made in that area, so we're going to look at what's been checked off that list, which would be wonderful, and adding new needs and priorities in there moving forward. And again, we're trying to get that information. We'll be back to you again in February, and then bringing that to the task force in April and hoping to finalize it by the summer. And Carrie Beeler, everyone's familiar with, with invasive exotic species, is my partner in crime on that one. Any questions on this area? Yes, ma'am. So um, I've always really appreciated the approach of the invasive exotic species and the EDRR approach in this plan, mm -hmm. and I and I really like that. Um, there's an attempt to go back and, and revisit and make sure that it's still relevant and, and encompassing all of the new things that are out there in terms of technology. Um, 
I also appreciate the fact that local government has a seat at this table and that there is an attempt and a desire to kind of connect at all levels of government. Um, Adam, you said boots on the ground and, and I really feel that because we are the boots on the ground in many large regional areas. Um, we have 32,000 acres of natural area in Palm Beach County alone that we manage. And so there is, um, I brought this up at a previous meeting, but I got actually no comments on it. Um, some of the tools in the toolbox that we use in the, in the way of herbicide use. We, we discussed that, I'm sorry to interrupt, but okay, yes, no. we did bring that up a bit in our most recent call. Oh, I'm sorry you weren't able to be on, but we did look at that as far as a management perspective and making sure that that's still a viable tool for natural areas. Okay, I'm sorry. that's yes. perfect. I mean, that's just an issue. So mm -hmm. I just received word this week of additional municipalities that are banning the use of glyphosate in their municipalities um, in Palm Beach County. Um, I know that there are areas of Miami-Dade that have done the same. Um, it's definitely a hot issue. Yeah. And so we are being asked at the local level to address it. And we are asking for support at the state and federal level to help us keep the appropriate information out there that needs to be shared about appropriate use of, of certain herbicides um, that help us keep the exotic species under control and um, to help us with that narrative and to help you know, support us and our mm -hmm. desire to, to use appropriately, not in a way that is harmful, um, to keep that as a tool in our toolbox. So that, that remains a big issue for us, and I just wanted to, I'll keep bringing it up. Oh, please so, do, and I was so you. appreciative of you bringing that to the table last time we had this discussion, because again, talking about that first line of defense and the, the progress made in working on some of these invasive plants, Oftentimes, the invasive animals get all the attention because they're a little bit more dramatic and ah, um, but it's the plants that we've made great strides in with these tools. And I don't want to go back to um, my childhood in the 80s with the Malaleuca problem and the allergies. You know, we don't want to go back to where we were on some of those issues. And I think people sometimes forget that um, these tools were very useful in getting us to where we are today and continuing to move forward on these invasive plants. It's definitely an issue, so thank you for raising that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on either topic? All right, thank you all very much. Alan, thank you very much for the great review and also a great thanks to everybody else who's involved in that, Laura Brant and Kerry Beeler and everybody else that's working on the ecological indicators and the invasive species update, the action framework update. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, would you like to introduce our next topic, please? I agenda item number four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Megan Jacoby, who's gonna give the um, update on the district's program and project updates uh, that are under the um, a CERT program, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Megan to uh, tell you all about what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, those of you who know me know I'm not much of a talker, but I was sitting back there um, just thinking about things, and so, Mr. Chair, if I could have your permission to just go back to Susan for just a minute. Please, go right ahead, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured while I was up here and had the guts to do it, I would just go ahead and say it. Um, Susan is a, a brilliant scientist and a wonderful woman that shares her knowledge with everybody. Um, but what I have learned most from her is that in doing what we do, Everglades restoration is a very important and it's a very serious topic. But Susan has taught me that it's, it's okay and it's also important to add levity and humor to what we do. And I really appreciate that because I like to laugh and I like to add humor to things. The other thing that she's taught me is that it's okay to sometimes be the troublemaker. <laughs> when things need a troublemaker, Susan is there and she does it in the right way and at the right time. And so I kind of hope to carry that tradition on so thank you. So that being said, with a little humor, here's the presentation. You all have probably heard this. You have heard this less than a month ago. But if you pay attention, there are a few little nuggets of newness to it. 
So first up, we're going to talk about the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Projects, which include SERP and non-SERP items. First up is the C44 Reservoir and STA. The Water Management District has uh, taken on the STA functions. And great news, just uh, early this month, we were able to open the first three of six cells and let water flow through those cells. We were lucky enough to have the governor come down and push the button. So it was a great experience for everybody. Next up is the C43 reservoir, which we expect to be complete in 2023. We were also able to do a groundbreaking for this in October, mid to late October, I think it was, um, where we all met on site and saw all the very exciting big machines that were there to do all the earthwork and everybody was, uh, everybody was really excited. Our project manager was thrilled to tell me that he got to drive one of the big machines and he was, he was all excited about that. So work is ongoing with the C43 reservoir um, and progress is going ahead. For SEP, the uh, old Tamiami Trail Removal Project is ongoing. We just started the power line relocation in late October and expect to have that completed by the end, uh, well, by mid-2020, um, somewhere in that time frame. C uh, the S333 North is a gated spillway that's going to provide existing uh, the existing S333 with additional capacity. We expect that to be completed in June of, this, of 2020. And then the STA for the EAA. We have been working on uh, the final designs for the inflow outflow canal. We expect those to be complete in January of 2020. We have applied for permits for the A2STA with the core and for the inflow canal with the DEP. And we've also worked on site investigations on, on the site of the A2STA uh, and reservoir. Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, we expect to uh, be completed with the phase two project management plan by the end of this year. We're also going to start uh, in, I believe, June, the June-ish time frame, uh, the planning effort for phase two. In the meantime, Cutler Wetlands design has been reinitiated, and we've completed all of the culverts for L31 East. Moving on to some of our state programs, we'll talk about some of our STAs. We have currently 57,000 acres of treatment that were completed in 2012. The performance for those um, STAs shows approximately an 80% reduction, and that's even given some of our uh, larger slugs of water that have been going through in years like 2018. Um, and just as a note, in those years, you'll see that, uh, that I'm not, not sure if this is going to show up on the, oops. Well, in that year, 2018, you'll see that was a very large water year. Um, so you can see a slight decrease in that performance, but that's just because the quantity and timing of water can impact their um, performance. Moving on to restoration strategies. This is a program that the state does that includes flow equalization basins, additional stormwater treatments to help our current stormwater treatment areas, and it increases our op operational flexibility. The L8 flow equalization basin is complete, was completed in June of 2017. This gives us an additional 45,000 acre feet of storage. The S375 expansion was completed in April of 2017. This will expand the flow capacity um, between STA1 East and West distribu distribution cells. We have two expansions for STA1 West. 
The first one uh, was flooded early this year. The second one will assist STA 1 West and 1 East and provide an additional 1,600 acres of stormwater treatment area, and our design began, began in 2018. The A1 FEB it was completed in July 2018. You can see there that we are actually seeing some, um, some nutrient reduction from this FEB. This FEB gives us an additional 60,000 acre feet of storage. The G341 conveyance improvements basically um, helps us move water east and west. It gives us more operational flexibility. Uh, we are in construction on segment four at this time. And this is just a picture of segment three. Um, so you can see what it looked like before and after. And then the last part of restoration strategies is the Western flow path. It includes the C139 FEB, as well as some earthwork in STA 56. Uh, the earthwork construction is in progress and we're designing the FEB at this time. The other portion, the lower portion of the annex is, state, is a state restoration effort where we're restoring former citrus groves to more, a more natural habitat but that, that section is not part of restoration strategies. And with that, I can take any questions. Adam? Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Thank you, Megan, for that. Um, going back to the, uh, if I could, on uh, SDA 1 West expansion number two, um, is there any kind of time frame for, you know, uh, bidding and, and getting to construction on that one? I believe we still need to complete our design in order to do that. Okay, so in order to understand that future uh, time frame, the design needs to be done? Right. Okay. Chad? Uh, Megan, great presentation as usual, but it, and this is just kind of a, I, I think there's a lot of other activities besides this that the district is very engaged in. And there's so many things that go on behind the scenes that, I mean, we don't have time to go into at this forum, but as far as the, the expertise that's being developed on running the STAs, learning how to operate these reservoirs, these are huge projects that are new. They've never been done before. And the district staff is doing an outstanding job of, of going through the process to learn how to maximize performance of these things. And uh, there's just a lot of really positive things going on here. I know the district, they're very humble. They don't like to brag. but. If, if you're paying attention, this is a very impressive thing. And I hope somebody, there's some historians out there kind of tracking this because the amount of construction going on right now is phenomenal as far as Everglades restoration construction. It's everywhere. Um, so I just would like to acknowledge all the folks behind the scenes and the ones out front, not just the construction guys because they're, they're obviously doing great work. But there's a lot of other folks that are operating the STAs and uh, the science folks and uh, all the policy folks that are helping to, get the funding to keep this machine going that uh, need to be acknowledged. Uh, it's a lot of great things. I just don't want it to be kind of a whole home presentation because this is a really, a really big deal. Thank you. Yeah, you're right, Chad. There's a, there's a lot that goes on behind it. And sometimes I struggle with this presentation because it doesn't really show all of that off. So my grand plan at some point <laughs> is to change this presentation up a little bit to show more of those other things that are going on. But you're absolutely right, there's a ton going on. Deb? In that spirit, you know, local governments are doing a lot of really interesting and large-scale restoration projects as well. And so I would be happy to volunteer to give a summary of, you know, some of the work that we've done in Palm Beach County within the Loxahatchee watershed. Mm -hmm. That is definitely um, consistent with um, the efforts in the CERT project. So I would be happy to offer to um, do a short presentation similar to this update um, of some of those projects if there's interest in doing so. Thank you very much, Deb. We'll definitely consider that. Mm -hmm. Looking around the table. 
Megan, I'd like to say thank you. It was a great presentation. I'd like to second a lot of what's been said at the table and just say that the, all the work going on in the background, there are some pretty significant projects coming online and being completed in 2020 that are tied directly to what I would call the traditional river grass when we're talking about the old Tamiami Trail project kicking off and the 333N project being completed. But in reality, those are smaller projects compared to some of the photos that we see here. And, and the photos don't quite do them justice. Having seen and, and been on a lot of these restoration projects, the scale and the magnitude is, is really impressive. So there are a number of them completed, a number of new ones coming online, and that's just incredible progress leading forward. So thank you very much for trying to summarize that and get it together in a few short, short slides for us. Well, at this time, I think, Megan, thank you very much. And we'll, well, I see we got a vacant seat at the table, so I'd like to welcome Howie Gonzalez up to the podium for our Army Corps of Engineers program and project update. Good deal. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Howie Gonzalez with the Corps of Engineers out of Jacksonville and Chief of our Everglades Restoration Program and have the opportunity to, to give you uh, an update on, on what the Corps of Engineers has been up to. Uh, definitely going to focus on, on what's been accomplished uh, since our last meeting in June, uh, but, but also take a, take a look ahead and try to project what FY20 uh, has in store for us and, and even beyond. <clears throat> From a program overview, um, uh, many of us in this room have an understanding on, on why we're doing Everglades restoration. These are the, the key elements that, that I typically go to and, and realize that uh, every day almost I have the opportunity to, to sell this program, whether it's a, a, a new team member at the Jacksonville District, uh, whether it's a, a media interview, or whether it's um, a, a teacher at my daughter's high school who wants to know why we're spending all of that money uh, on Everglades restoration. But, but ultimately, um, these are points that we can have to continue to, to emphasize with regards to the importance on why we're making such a significant investment. Uh, part of, of what we have here is stuff that, that we know, stuff that we've seen, uh, but, but also looking forward to, to help continue to project what are some of the, the items that aren't on this list? What are those actual recreation and, and tourism impacts? Uh, what does a, a, a dollar of Everglades restoration give us? I know there have been assessments in the past, uh, but looking forward, it's trying to make a projection of where do we stand now with the $200 million federal and $250 million non-federal and, and FY20 and then the continued increased funding for our program, uh, what are we able to show that's actually making linkages to areas that we aren't quite familiar with, or areas that aren't on this slide? From a programmatic perspective, uh, we, we continue to work from our projects and their authorizations. Uh, this is a slide I, I use to try to put some, some structure to the content of, a, of my presentation, understanding that we have projects that were authorized uh, back in the 80s and 90s that we're still working on, but uh, as we've seen on an integrated delivery schedule, those projects are nearing completion within the next couple of years. So I look forward to the day in the next couple of years where this slide will be a SERP slide only, uh, as we would have completed construction on those foundation projects and focus all of our energy and resources on that comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. So what I'll do now is take us through uh, the progress on some of the foundation projects and flow into SERP, talk a little bit about what studies we have going on, uh, and then again focus on that FY20 budget and beyond. For Kissimmee River restoration, uh, this is construction in a riverine environment, so it's very dependent upon seasons. Uh, as we're now into the dry season, uh, we have contractors back at work doing backfill uh, putting plugs in place and working on a restoration uh, effort that's scheduled for completion. Uh, at this point, we're tracking 2021, but we're, we're teetering in that late 20, 2021 time frame. Uh, there's no doubt the, the Mother Nature will play a role in this as we have a, a lot of work scheduled to be accomplished between now and May, uh, but we are realizing benefits from backfill efforts completed previously uh, and are confident that with the work we have scheduled over the next six to nine months that we'll get the foundation in place to actually have the full backfill complete uh, by the end of 2020. 
Understanding, too, that once we're complete with construction, we have a, a five-year post-monitoring, uh, post-construction monitoring period where we'll confirm that we're achieving the restoration benefits and engage any adaptive management if required. For the modified water deliveries to Everglades National Park project, uh, again, a project that we're working at this point to have completed construction in 2018. Uh, our efforts now focused on that combined operational plan. Uh, many of you in this room have supported that project delivery team uh, to identify a, a recommended plan and we're moving forward to completion of that combined operational plan in the summer of 2020. A point of emphasis on this project is its direct connection to Central Everglades planning project. So the combined operational plan serves as a baseline for the Central Everglades planning project and those two items being linked through environmental compliance documents and so forth uh, are dependent upon each other. So our, our success and progress on, on COP uh, will lead directly to our success and progress on construction contract awards and project partnership agreements for Central Everglades Planning Project. For the C-111 South Dade project, uh, we anticipate construction completion in early 2020. This date has continued to move as uh, we, we're working on armoring some of the, the last berms that we have uh, in that project area, but it isn't uh, at this point affecting any of the project operations. It's another challenge with wet season um, down at that, in that project area and ensuring that we can get this construction complete in early 2020. At this point, we have temporary pump stations, uh, familiar with pump station 332B and C, uh, which were constructed in, in more of a temporary fashion. We're working on a project report called the Post Authorization Change Report to make those temporary pump stations uh, more permanent structures. So that's one of the items we have teed up for a Water Resources Development Act of 2020 consideration. Into this comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. You see the nomenclature most associated with our early generation uh, projects, first and second, Central Everglades planning project, and then our current ongoing planning efforts. For Indian River Lagoon South, um, going to what Chad just mentioned, the, the construction project I was able to visit yesterday at C44, uh, and even within the last six months uh, since our last meeting, the, the contractor has made significant progress on embankment construction uh, on soil cement, which is the covering of the interior of the embankment. So uh, at this point, it's a significant um, progress that the contractor is making, uh, a little bit better able to work during the wet season, so that progress, uh, I feel, uh, will even intensify uh, as we're now into the dry season. Um, this is one that if, if you have an opportunity to, to get out there and visit, it's, it's really impressive in that you can stand at a certain location and as far as you, you can see, north, south, east, and west, you're seeing the C44 project, so, so very impressive. Definitely want to acknowledge the, the work that Megan communicated on the stormwater treatment areas and the water that we have now and uh, some of the stormwater treatment area cells. Um, so that's a, a definite positive in our ability to attain uh, early restoration benefits. So definitely more to come uh, on that project uh, as we expect completion in 2021, followed by that operational testing and monitoring. Uh, at this point, from a funding standpoint, this project is, is what we call fully funded. So the funding in, in uh, FY20 to the $200 million is more for supervision and administration and not actual contract execution, which is, which is important because once we get these contracts fully funded, we can look to that next big investment. And with regards to next big investments, a significant portion of our FY20 funding is for the Picayune Strand Restoration Project, having constructed the three project pump stations uh, and working to transfer that last um, pump station, the Miller Pump Station, into operations uh, into O&M. Uh, we expect that to happen uh, in 2020. So we're now taking on the significant last portions of construction, including road removal and some canal plugging. Canal plugging. Uh, the Southwest Protection Features is to protect that 6Ls area uh, to the west, and we'll be initiating construction on uh, both conveyance and that protection feature in 2020. Megan covered C43. Again, our role with that is working closely with South Florida Water Management District. Uh, with regards to 
meeting federal standards for construction and ultimately being eligible for work in kind credits. We're currently working on a post authorization change report to update the total project cost. We had a, a total project cost increase. And so that's another item that'll be under consideration for the Water Resources Development Act of 2020. For Broward County Water Preserve Areas, uh, since our last meeting, we continue to work on design of the C11 impoundment. Uh, we worked to transfer to operations and maintenance of our initial construction contract uh, of small berm uh, that we constructed. And so our next big investment and engagement will be the C11 impoundment. Uh, we still have another couple of years of design, but are tracking towards a 2022 construction contract award. Uh, this is another element that is identified and linked to the Central Everglades planning project. So it's important that we continue to engage these Generation 1 and Generation 2 projects to support ultimately implementation and success of SEP. For the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, a, a good mix of construction efforts between the South Florida Water Management District and the Corps. Our big efforts over the last six months have been finalizing the design for our final two construction contracts for the L31 East components. Uh, we expect construction contract awards of those last two contracts in 2020. The C-111 Spreader Canal, a project constructed by the Water Management District, we continue to work closely on project modeling uh, that will help us confirm any final real estate requirements for that project. But at this point, the project is being operated and monitoring is ongoing. For Central Everglades planning project, we have activities going on in planning, design, and construction. At this point, we're working on the follow-up report as required uh, from Water Resources Development Act 2018 uh, that EAA Reservoir is identified as a part of Central Everglades planning project in the new water component. We're still on track to complete that follow-up report in May of 2020. Uh, that will then allow us to move forward with the final detailed design of the reservoir and to support any pre-partnership credit agreements with the South Florida Water Management District for their construction efforts on elements contained in their Section 203 or in the now SEP new water component. From a design standpoint, we're heavily into design on SEP South features. Uh, these will be structures in the L67 levees, which will promote conveyance from Water Conservation Area 3A to 3B, and we expect those construction contract awards in the latter part of our fiscal year 2020 and during the summer of 2020. Uh, another emphasis on that linkage to the combined operational plan, as we move forward with COP, it maintains that baseline for SEP. The environmental documents and biological opinions for SEP will then allow us to execute project partnership agreements we need executed project partnership agreements to award construction contracts. So that was about a 30-second USAIS process flow statement that I just put out there that um, is, is pretty complicated. A lot of pieces have to fall in place. Uh, a lot of us in the room here are working very hard to ensure that those pieces fall in place. And ultimately, a significant part of our 2020 program, that $200 million, will be through Central Everglades Planning Project. Shifting now to the studies that we have ongoing, uh, Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project is a project implementation report that's nearing completion. We're working through the final stages of PIR development. Expect to have a senior leaders panel, which is one of the final milestones in our smart planning process, and a chief's report in March 2020. This will be for uh, Water Resources Development Act 20 consideration. For the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Project, uh, another project in the final stages of project development. This is our project that, along with Kissimmee River Restoration, provides for restoration and water storage north of Lake Okeechobee. Uh, we're working on a senior leaders panel in February of 2020, a chief's report in May, uh, which puts us right up against the last time frames to be able for, to be eligible for consideration in word of 2020. For the Western Everglades Restoration Project, we had a good bit of discussion on this one at the task force meeting at the end of October. Uh, at that meeting, we presented a notification of the Corps' intent to terminate that study. Uh, at the task force meeting and by task force requests, we conducted a meeting on 22 November with all of the key 
players in the Western Everglades Restoration Project, and at this point, we're assessing our discussions from that meeting, um, and our path forward on that project is still to be determined. For budget review, just to reemphasize where we currently plan to obligate the $200 million, we see with the heavy amounts being on Central Everglades Planning Project, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, and Picayune Strand Restoration, Indian River Lagoon South. And what I want to emphasize at that bottom, that operations and maintenance, this is the first year in several years that we've actually received operations and maintenance funding in the budget. Uh, those funds are focused primarily on requirements of biological opinions, but sets us in a good position for us to request additional funds in FY20 to cover our SERP-related operations and maintenance requirements. So key takeaways, again, continue to emphasize our strong federal interests and in our strategic partnerships, um, the opportunity to continue progress in all phases of what we're doing from planning, design, construction, and, and ultimately operations and maintenance, which is where we achieve our restoration benefits. Interrelated milestones between our projects. Uh, you heard me emphasize the link between combined operational plan and Central Everglades planning project. Those uh, are key linkages that we need to keep in mind as we look at project schedules and project resources. And then continued administration and, and congressional funding. We have to continue to, to show that our integrated delivery schedule is our plan, that we have the ability, as you see in some of the out years, to reach close to a billion dollars per year. And that's just what we'll have ready from an engineering and technical standpoint to award construction contracts on. So we're ready. Show us the money. Lastly, definitely lots of good information, evergladesrestoration.gov. And with that, I'll take any questions. Looking around the table. Bob? Uh, Howie, I know the state was recently appropriated $50 million for ASR uh, investigation or wells for the Lake Okeechobee watershed project. And I just wanted to show, how is that going to fit into the, the Corps' process in terms of the PIR and so on? <laughs> And this may be a question for Megan or, or Jennifer too. I don't, I don't know. I'm just curious. I, having just reviewed a document yesterday where I was signing off and trying to understand that, um, I'd just like to, if there's any information, that'd be helpful. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at that. So um, within the PIR itself, we've also, um, we've got a lot of language in there talking about taking like a phased approach for implementing ASR. So um, I think there's been a little bit of a perception out there that when we talk about 80 ASR wells associated with LACO, that people think that, you know, the district um, and maybe the Corps are going to go out and just dig 80 wells in the ground, which that's not, that's not the case. We're going to uh, follow uh, along on those 2015 guidelines that we got from the National Academy. Um, you know, we have two existing wells out there right now, right? So we're looking to refurbish those, um, and that's part of the $50 million that we received in state appropriations. Um, and they're also going to look to, um, you know, maybe put in some uh, two additional well clusters. Um, and so those are the same locations that have been identified within the LACO project. So they are associated with that. And it will be done in a phased, stepwise fashion um, that both the uh, core and the Water Management District have agreed that that's the best way to kind of move forward with that, um, with that program. James. Thanks, Holly. Great presentation. Uh, I think it's going to be really important that we continue to lay out the economic consequences of not, um, you know, adequately funding SERP at the federal level and meeting our project milestones. I, I think we're making a lot of progress right now, but um, looking into the future, you know, on the IDS schedule, some of those numbers are pretty big, and um, it's going to take some significant funding to get those projects done and keep them on schedule. So I think it's just going to be critical that in our reporting, that we lay out what those economic consequences, whether it's to real estate values, to water supply, to the estuaries, whatever it might be, Lake Okeechobee, eco, you know, ecological impacts. I think that all needs to be quantified and laid out to our policymakers so they understand what it's going to cost the taxpayers of Florida uh, and this country if we don't achieve those milestones. So I think that's going to be important in the future. Excuse me. Pedro? Hmm. So, Howie, I, uh, I just want to uh, emphasize uh, 
what I think I heard you say in the context of uh, Western Everglades restoration. You acknowledged that there was a meeting on uh, November 20th. Uh, it was a good meeting, in my opinion. A lot of great conversation. Uh, the most important thing that I heard in your comments was uh, how you wrapped it up, uh, path forward. And uh, that sounds positive. Uh, I think we heard it clearly from the task force uh, that uh, we need to find a way to restore the western part of the system. Uh, it is a project that's important to Big Cypress National Preserve uh, and its natural integrity as well as important to the park. Uh, as you know, we have uh, trust responsibilities to the Miccosukee and the Seminole tribes. Uh, and our partners in the tribes uh, also feel very strongly about uh, this project moving forward. Uh, you know, I, I acknowledge that we have uh, bumped into some hurdles along the way, and some of those uh, hurdles uh, may be complicated to maneuver through. Uh, but, you know, what I walked away uh, hearing from the task force and in speaking with a lot of people is that when there's a will, there's a way. And I sure hope that, uh, you know, that's the message that the colonel uh, received. Uh, I'm encouraged by your words. Uh, again, a path forward, that's uh, what I'm going to walk away from your report with, uh, with respect to, uh, to WERP, uh, because we need to uh, keep moving it forward, in my opinion. I also want to acknowledge uh, the fact that the chairman of the Miccosukee tribe uh, has sent uh, me a letter. I believe that he sent Secretary Bernhardt a similar letter as well, uh, expressing some concern about this. Uh, and also expressing concern about several other items, uh, including COP, which you mentioned. And with respect to that, I, I just want to make sure that uh, we all agree and understand that the tribe's concerned, concerns uh, need to be seriously heard uh, and incorporated into the work that's being done with respect to that project or that part of the project. Uh, again, uh, the Park Service has trust responsibilities with both tribes, and their concerns are very important to us. A uh, lot of information up there, Howie, a lot of moving parts, uh, and I, I really appreciate the partnership with the Corps and everything that the Colonel is doing to help us all move these things forward. Thank you. You got to show some love to the Corps of Engineers as well. <laughs> um, and fortunately for the department, we're involved with these projects in the permitting realm as far as and in planning, and we get to see these things happening. And the Corps of Engineers is ex executing contracts mm -hmm. like nobody's business. They're getting the job done, and um, and I'm hoping that there's going to be some <laughs> celebratory because I think how are we down to like one last contract on the Kissimmee River restoration? Is it? Yes. And, and then it's, it's done. It's like, hey, goal line. And then uh, I think the Herbert Hoover Dyke, um, there's work on con the culverts and the banks out there uh, going on as we speak right now. And they've done a great job with that. And there's been a lot of cooperation with the state as far as uh, contributing. The state's contributed a little funding in there to help out with the effort. And the Corps is taking it and, and, and going and getting it done. And uh, it's unfortunate. Most of us, our day job, we don't get to get out and see these projects. But a lot of time, I get reports back from our field inspectors and stuff with some photos and things like that. that are, it's, it's incredible. There's a lot of things going on out there. It's a big state, and the, the core is getting it done. And I wouldn't be concerned at all with if these two projects that are lined up right now, the Loxahatchee and the Lake Okeechobee, if these things all get congressional authorization, I'm confident that the core can execute these things and get them done and at the EAA Reservoir simultaneously or sequence them in a way to get them all done and uh, in an efficient manner. So congratulations to the Corps on their progress. I love pop. Yes. <laughs> I just want to put a plug in for the work after the construction and on the operational side, because we forget about all the time we spend 
actually getting projects up and running. So a project like the combined operating plan, the new operational plan that's going to go into effect next year. So Everglades National Park, after a very dry September and October, went to zero inflows in November. And we will probably have no inflows into Shark Slough until May of next year. That's not a natural thing. It's tied to the current rainfall formula we have. So we work really hard to come up with a new rainfall formula that will go into effect with the new combined operating plan. And 600,000 acres of marsh downstream will see flows into the dry season that it's not seeing now. So think about the importance of after we build these things, making sure we turn them on and we make the connection back to the operations because that's the critical piece that a lot of people not in these rooms spend their life doing, working on these operational plans to link everything together. So I just want to make sure we talk about the kind of the real world benefit of the projects after the construction phase. So thanks. Adam. Thank you. Um, thank you, Howie. Um, and the core for the time and effort that takes to put these presentations on and, and provide a, an update. Um, you know, while prior to uh, Superintendent Rambo speaking, I was thinking about the, the same topic here. I had some notes um, re regarding WERP here to the group, and, and we appreciate uh, Assistant Secretary Dr. Petty and, and, and the task force to to allow the OERI and, and to put together the meeting for uh, the work, the work uh, group. So what I looked at that as that meeting was the Mythbusters. There was information that was shared on both sides of the table where everybody was learning, learning about how flow worked in, in with regards to the project. Folks learned at the meeting about what property ownership meant at the meeting, really got into the weeds on both sides, understood from you know, both of the tribe's interests where they resided at this meeting. And I too walked away with a very positive uh, path forward on, on continuing to work on this complicated project as all Everglades restoration projects are complex. And that um, I look forward to the future of the project and I believe that yes, it was a, an episode of Mythbusters, but walked away with a very positive um, outcome and potential uh, future progress and that it is much needed like Superintendent Ramos had said um, during his uh, his brief uh, portion there the the solutions are in front of us thank you thank, thank you Adam Howie I'd like to hit you with a question here Bob commented a little bit about the combined operations plan and in your presentation you talked about the relationship to the combined operations plan to Central Everglades project could you unpack that a little bit for us, for everybody at the table? The link between COP and SEP? Yeah, you were talking about SEP building on COP and the relationship between them in your presentation. Right, so from, a, from an operations standpoint, the combined operational plan gives us an, an alternative that, that'll be implemented to deal with the operations in the southern end of the system. So the Central Everglades planning project uh, from a construction standpoint relies on what the most current operational plan is. So if we don't have a combined operational plan in place, then the baseline that SEP's using to say that as we build these project components, this is how they'll ultimately be operated, uh, is, is somewhat called into question. So from an environmental document standpoint, from our relationship with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and what we need in a biological assessment for the work that we're going to do and a follow-on biological opinion. If COP isn't landed, then we don't have a firm understanding of what we refer to as the baseline for the Central Everglades Planning Project. So then the basis for which the documents that SEP is built upon uh, is, is a little bit uncertain. So. At this point, the, those environmental documents are necessary in order for us to say that, yes, we are ready to go forward, execute a project partnership agreement, and ultimately award uh, construction contracts. But understanding that you know, the, the engineering and science that those documents are built upon uh, is what ultimately allows us to say you know, what, what a biological assessment would look like, and, and it's making sure that the tools that we use to get to those answers uh, that it gives, like for example, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the confidence to say that, okay, we, we see what you're tracking on, we agree with your assessment, and, and ultimately are gonna give you this opinion that says, yes, you know, this is, this is a sound project. So 
Uh, that's the, the main linkage between those two. Uh, there, there are other linkages that we established in Central Everglades Planning Project back in the original plan uh, that discussed predecessors to fully implementing SEP and, and operating SEP. Uh, that was the other linkage I discussed with regards to the Broward County Water Preserve Area and having that C11 impoundment. But we always know as we go along and we see how projects work, we see how we have operational flexibility uh, allows us the opportunity to, to revisit those prerequisites, revisit those linkages as we go along. But from a, from a product development standpoint right now, uh, landing COP is very important to us to be able to get to where we need to be this year on Central Everglades. All right, thank you very much. Sure. That was very detailed. Hmm. One last time, looking around the room. All right, thank you very much, Howie. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to stay here if you like. You're at the table. We'd like to recognize Chairman Bob Johnson for a National Research Council uh, report update. I think uh, most of you know that the National Research Council uh, has been in place uh, as uh, uh, kind of an independent peer review effort for this project. Yep. Excellent. I did. <laughs> All right. So we've had independent peer review on Everglades restoration projects going back to 2000. Uh, and the newest effort, uh, Committee on the Independent Scientific Review of Everglades Restoration Progress started in 2005. This is a uh, mandate written into the Water Resource Development Act of 2000, and it's uh, basically set up with uh, three agencies as the sponsors, uh, Department of Interior, Army Corps of Engineers, and South Florida Water Management District, and they're in the middle uh, part of this. You can see the shall produce a biennial report to Congress, uh, and that's going to the Secretary of the Army, Secretary of Interior, and the Governor. Uh, that includes an assessment of the measures of progress on restoration ecology uh -huh. in the national system. And I just put the bottom uh, bullets in there because these are their formal charges each year, and it really reflects closely to what they work on on each report as they go forward. So they do an assessment of the progress in restoring the natural system. They do an assessment of any specific scientific or engineering issues that might impact the progress. Is there something that's coming up that's slowing down what we're doing? Are there constraints that hold us from moving forward on projects to achieve the natural system benefits? And then they do a review of the monitoring and assessment protocols, the science side. Are we monitoring the right things to measure restoration success at the end after projects are completed? So we're in the eighth uh, round of the biennial reviews uh, that began in May of 2019. Uh, we've had three open meetings up to this point. I don't know how many of you had a chance to attend them, but it started in April of 2019, uh, and then another one in August and then in November. Uh, the next uh, and last proposed meeting is scheduled for February of 2020. Uh, and they've been fortunate to have field trips for basically every meeting this cycle, which is unusual for them. So they're really spending a lot of time out in the field looking at the projects we were just talking about so they see these things on the ground, uh, both the resource that's going to benefit from the project but the actual construction site. So I think that's been very valuable for them. That bullet in the middle is basically what they've been focusing on. They're very focused in this cycle on what are the major ongoing restoration projects that are happening during this reporting cycle. What's getting done between 2019 and 2020? That's what ends up in their report. Uh, and fortunately, this is a good time for them and a good time for us in terms of what's going on. And then how is the monitoring and ecological indicators tracking that restoration progress, how well that's going. So uh, meeting one, 8.1, is the meeting that happened in, uh, in April and then in May. Uh, and then they started at the southern end of the system. So they were looking at the central and southern Everglades restoration projects, the ones that Howie was talking about related to modified water deliveries, C-111, and uh, the beginning phases of SEP, and they went out and saw the areas on the ground uh, in Water Conservation Area 3A where we're learning from the decompartmentalization and sheet flow restoration project. Uh, 
learning specifically the importance of restoring sheet flow and to open up the system. The next place they went on that day was to Tamiami Trail, and they looked at the importance of basically opening up the system, allowing the marsh to be reconnected across Tamiami Trail and trying to remove these obstructions to flow. So that's another important project that they learned about. And then we spent a lot of time along the eastern boundary of the park talking about the completion of the modified water deliveries and C-111 South Dade projects, looking at areas like the Nap Square Mile area and Las Palmas and what benefits we get as those project components move forward, as well as the C-111 South Dade conveyance system. And then the following meeting that occurred uh, focused on these topics. So this is kind of the agenda that they work their way through as they uh, go. Since this is the first kickoff meeting uh, for CISRIP 8, half the committee are generally people that are on the panel from the prior rounds, and then the other half, seven others, are people that are new or sometimes returning people. So we always do an Everglades hydrology and kind of uh, ecology overview for them to sort of try to get them up to speed quickly. The next thing we always do for everyone is a SERP 101, where we go over the goals and objectives, uh, what is the system-wide range of components that SERP covers, and then at a very broad level, what are the benefits and constraints that we're trying to address or uh, remove as we move forward. And then we just started going through the major in, uh, initiatives that are happening in 2019 and 2020, and you can basically identify these as what's the big project delivery teams we're working on now. So we're working right now on the completion of the Herbert Hoover Dyke and its associated operational plan in Lake Okeechobee. Uh, they wanted to know about the startup of the Central Everglades project, and, and that's going to begin with the southern components. So we spent a lot of time talking about the SEP South components in the EA Reservoir, sort of the next thing out of the box. And then they spent a lot of time focusing on the recover process, the, both the reporting side of recover, which I'll talk about next, and also uh, the indicators that are used for that. And then they had a panel of stakeholders talking about perspectives on key challenges, so a number of stakeholders that are here all the time interacting with the task force and our uh, organizations spoke to the group about uh, challenges they see in terms of how restoration moves forward. And at the end of every meeting in this process, uh, the first meeting, they always ask for uh, feedback from the sponsors and other agencies on what were the things that were most, most valuable from their last report and were the things that they missed the mark on. And then they ask about what are the new issues that they think are important for us to tell them to work on. And so that's how they kick off their cycle each time. They ask what, what you gained from the last set of reports and what's the new things you want to make sure they include in the next set of reports. Uh, then we go into uh, the next meeting in August, and again, they had a field trip. This one was all focused on the Indian River Lagoon area, so they were able to get out on the water and see the area and also see the C-44 reservoir area. And that field trip was focused on the health of the Indian River Lagoon and the status of the various uh, ecological indicators that we use to track the health. So they got uh, in the field information on algal blooms, SAV, and oysters, and then also the progress on C-44 construction. Uh, going into their... Uh, I'm just finishing up their second meeting. This is the remaining topics they got into. Uh, they got into a discussion about system-wide water management, uh, basically how the water budget works, uh, what are the constraints on moving water where we want to, like the constraints on moving water south, and then how do those constraints and uh, operations relate to the targets we're meeting. And then this meeting really focused on the estuaries. So there was a long segment on the conditions in the northern estuaries, and a long segment on the conditions in the southern estuaries under this argument that if you can get the southern ends, the coastal ends of the systems right, then you're probably operating the central part of the systems correctly. And so they asked a lot of questions about uh, how the conditions in the estuaries are today, how they are changing, uh, how are the SERP objectives being met. We spent a bunch of time talking about the status of blue-green algae in the northern estuaries. And then they always ask, how is new science influencing the decisions we're making on the targets? And so that's a, a key topic that follows through. This report uh, overlapped with the completion of the recover system status report and the report card. So they had a section where we went through the indicators in some detail talking about what is the current status of the system and what do we know about ecosystem health based on both the SSR and the report card, which I think they're very encouraged to have these types of documents out there. And then we spent a lot of time talking about the use of modeling in SERP. Uh, they got overviews on the various types of uh, 
ecological, hydrological, and water quality models that are used. We looked at three case studies, uh, specifically how modeling has been used in Western Everglades in the combined operating plan and for the interim goals and interim targets. And then they asked the question, uh, what are the key modeling needs and how can modeling better support decision making and adaptive management as we go forward? Uh, and they, they really spent a lot of time on that because they see this learning process that we go through through things like the, in, the uh, incremental field tests we did. You know, we, we finished four years of incremental testing on the modified water delivers in C-111 project, and that went into the design and the combined operating plan. So that's the way they like to see projects move forward where we build on the science and we adaptively manage projects. And then the third meeting in October started with a field trip at the southern end in Florida Bay and then Biscayne Bay. So they went out into the coastal areas uh, in uh, Florida Bay where they receive water from the eastern side of the park, water coming down Taylor Slough. We went out to the long-term ecological research sites, uh, one of the largest LTER programs in the country sponsored by the National Science Foundation is in Everglades National Park. And it's the indicator on the success of all the things we do upstream. And so we went to some of their sites there and looked at the role of freshwater flow on the nearshore environment and how that affects Florida Bay salinity and the downstream ecosystem. Then they went over to Biscayne Bay and they looked at the progress on the L31 East and the Deering Estate features and talked specifically about the restoration benefits that we see on the ground from those projects moving forward. And then these are the topics from the upcoming meeting. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the combined operating plan, kind of understanding how the operating plan has evolved over time, the historical context, what we learned from the incremental field tests, how we designed the adaptive management process that's supposed to tell us how we're gonna do monitoring for the next five plus years afterwards. Uh, we had a presentation on the Blue Green Algae Task Force, uh, the key objectives, questions, findings that have happened. The last report had a recommendation to look at a mid-course assessment and we're not specifically doing that directly. I would argue that the, uh, uh, in, in the IDS is basically uh, our ongoing assessment of where we are on a regular basis, but the things they're asking for are the things we're addressing in the interim goals, interim targets, the things we're addressing in the vulnerability analysis. And so we're meeting their request through a series of incremental steps, things we're learning. So they spent time on that vulnerability analysis, the process that Recover has set up to do that, the methodology, what we think the benefits of doing this vulnerability analysis will be in affecting our decision making. And then that led right into how the, uh, the uh, interim delivery schedule functions and what information went into it to gain knowledge on why we make changes. Uh, what are the factors that lead to updates? Uh, and then how do these changes affect our ability to deliver benefits? And that's where they learned about the key dependencies and timelines for these projects. and. Uh, they had a panel discussion uh, on how uh, basically with managers talking about how science informs their decision-making process, how does SERP adapt to new information and learning, and this was the manager's perspective on how science is used. And then uh, the final topics, just uh, we're just having our earliest discussions, the liaisons with the uh, National Research Council staff and the topics that they're looking at for the upcoming meeting in February include uh, an update on the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual, uh, where we're going with that, where we are in terms of alternatives at this point. Uh, UF's Water Institute's report on Lake Okeechobee, they want to get a briefing on that, and they've talked about uh, there's a split within the committee on things that they want to go and see, and one group that hasn't been to Picayune Strand wants to go to the Picayune Strand, and another group wants to focus on the Kusahatchee system. So I think we'll have two smaller field trips on this meeting just to make sure that people see the parts of the system they haven't seen before. And then throughout this process, we tend to have follow-up conference calls uh, that build off of what happened in the meetings. And this is a list of topics that they are estimating we will do some type of smaller group conference calls. Uh, the team breaks up into different topics and you can see the same things we talked about before. They wanna know about interim goals, interim targets results. They wanna know where we are gonna be with WERP as we go forward with the project, the trade-offs we faced in COP, all these various topics. So that's kind of where we expect to end up. Uh, uh, a report for CISREP uh, 8 is expected around July of 2020. 
So you can see they have a very short timeline between their last meeting in February and the production of the next report. That's why these small uh, conference calls end up uh, sort of filling the gap. As they start writing their report, they find things they want to know more about, then they set up these calls. So uh, if anyone has any questions at that point? Looking around the table for questions. Bob, thank you very much for the very thorough presentation. It's a good update. So after that last meeting, what is the anticipated time? Do you have any idea what the anticipated time between that last meeting and re report production is? Yeah. So it's, a, it's about four months to produce a report. That's the, that's the rough draft that, we, that sponsors get, and they start producing the uh, sort of the products that go out to the public, but you know the final published document doesn't come out for a few more months. But somewhere around July is their schedule for the production of the next biennial report in rough form, in draft form. Another 2020 date. Lots happening in 2020. Yes. Adam, I'd like to hand off to you for agenda item number seven. Thank you, James. Um, in addition, another item to happen in 2020 is the, uh, one of my office's responsibility is uh, the reporting requirements. Um, the Kevin, along with support from the OER, OERI team, Kevin's going to be providing us uh, an update on uh, the reporting requirements and purpose. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Adam. Um, 2020 is going to be a busy year, James. Um, in terms of the task force's reporting requirements for 2020, there are three documents that we'll be working on uh, with you all. Uh, the first of those is the cross-cut budget. Um, the cross-cut budget is a requirement under Word in 1996. All three of these reports actually are required as a part of uh, the task force's uh, charter and uh, Word in 1996 statutory requirements. The cross-cut budget meets the requirement to prepare coordinated budget requests, um, which is specified in WERDA. So the timeline for the cross-cut budget, generally um, the president and the governor released their proposed budgets in the February 2020 timeframe. So around that time, once we know that both the federal budget and the state budget have been released, uh, we, our office will send out a request for the information to incorporate that into the next edition of the cross-cut budget. So in February, the requests will go out to whoever the, the designated points of contact are for the, for the agencies. Around March, we'll, we'll anticipate a turnaround time around Mar mid-March to late March, and by April or early May, uh, depending on if there are any delays, um, the cross-cut budget would be completed and would be posted on our website. The second of those, and probably the, the heaviest lift of the three reporting requirements, is the biannual report. Um, the biannual report, again, a requirement uh, uh, to report on restoration progress for the task force. Uh, we anticipate that, that that process will get kicked off in the March to April time frame. Um, the reporting period will be July 1, 20, uh, 2018 through June 30th, 2020. So, but the requests for the information to be incorporated into that report will go out in around March or, or early April. Uh, with an anticipated turnaround time around the end of June uh, with the first version of the report that would be circulated to the working group in the SCG for review and comment. Um, in August, we would take whatever feedback we get on the report from the group, um, go back to the drawing board, do a final version of the report, and in the August time frame, we would distribute it a second go around to the working group and SCG for review and approval. Once we have working group and SCG approval for the report, uh, we would anticipate that around the October uh, timeframe of the uh, task force meeting, October, November timeframe, that we would have the approval of the working group and the SCG to 
pass the report up to the task force for final approval. Once we get final approval from the task force, then the document goes to OMB for final clearance and then to uh, the Department of Interior, to the Secretary for final clearance, and then the report is transmitted to Congress. Um, we would anticipate that would happen around the end of uh, calendar year 2020. So that's, that's the biannual report. Uh, the third report that we uh, are required to do statutorily under WERDA is the Integrated Financial Plan, which is, uh, I, I know everyone here is familiar with the Integrated Financial Plan. It's the project sheets uh, and the summary and the roll-up of those project sheets. For that, we would anticipate around a May 2020 request for updated information from our office um, with a turnaround time of about six to eight weeks, uh, taking us into a, the July time frame. And we would anticipate, as we collect all that information and consolidate it, that around September 2020 would be the release and posting of the 2020 Integrated Financial Plan uh, on, on the EvergladesRestoration.gov website. Um, so that, 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 in addition to 2020 being the year that uh, the Corps is responsible to submit their five-year report to SERP on Congress, uh, to, to the Congress. We're going to have a pretty aggressive and, and uh, heavy, heavy lift to get all these reports done in the, in the time frames that I've just laid out for everyone. So we really are going to need everyone to assist and cooperate in providing the information in a reasonably time, timely fashion. Um, with that, I'll answer any questions anybody might have about any of the, re of the task force's reporting requirements. Ed Smith? Yeah, well, thank you for this. I think laying out these time frames is, is a huge help for the department. I know it's, it's always a heavy lift to get all these things because we have to reach out to several agencies within our agency. So thank you for that. And you know, we look forward to supporting any way we can. And so Thanks, Ed. Appreciate that. Kevin, thank you for laying out the dates. There's, again, like you said, a lot going on. And, and Adam, I'm going to look over to you and just let you know that we're going to be leaning on the staff over to RERI to get those reports all together. I'd like to move on to agenda number eight, and I'll ask that Howie Gonzalez kicks us off. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce Ava Velez. Ava will give this next presentation. Uh, Ava serves on our team as a strategic program manager for our South Florida program with leadership of uh, key programmatic items, including the integrated delivery schedule in this 2020 report to Congress. So I'll turn it over to Ava. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, I, I'd like to take my opportunity to show my love for Ms. Susan here. Please do. I didn't do it before because I thought I would get, you know, my chance here at the podium. So I have a lot of reasons to love Susan. Um, and although I have not known her as long as some of you, um, my time with her has been just nothing short of wonderful. And so one of the things I love most about her is um, I used to walk around with a mug. I'm a big coffee drinker. And I used to walk around with a mug that said, I solemnly swear I'm up to no good. And it has a picture of the Marauders map, if any of you are Harry Potter fans. And so she and I are, so we were fast friends after that because I walked into a meeting, she saw my mug and she went, I love Harry Potter. And a bunch of people didn't even know what it was. And I thought, okay, she and I are totally on the same page here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, thank you, Susan, for everything that you did for me, uh, how generous you were with me. And I will miss you, but I see you on Facebook, and I have your cell phone number, so we're not going away anytime soon. So thank you. Thank you for that chance, Mr. Chair. So with all the reports that we have in 2020, I feel like I need to somehow incentivize y'all's willingness to work with me on this one. Uh, our report to Congress is due uh, next year, and I have provided some handouts um, that have a draft outline of their report, and it has a draft schedule of the report. 
couple things I wanted to point out. So our reporting period is Ju July 2015 through June 2020. And um, in the next week or so, you will be receiving an email from us with an official request for a point of contact. And my goal is to have the kickoff PDT January 28th. Um, and, and for the writers to work for the following two months. I'm hoping that we'll be able to leverage a lot of the information that is gathered for the South Florida Environmental Report that gets launched March 1. So I tried to stagger it so that we can leverage each other's information instead of recreating a bunch of things because we have so many reports in 2020. I can think of at least four major ones. Um, and so just wanted to make sure I pointed out that that late January kickoff, um, April, we're hoping to finish with the actual writing and then there's a lot, a lot of reviewing and, and letters from all of our agency leaders. So I wanted to finish on a very positive note. The, the last page of the 2015 version of the report has a to-do list essentially for the next five years. And if you take a look at it, we've done quite well. Um, the anticipated construction completions, we've, out of like 12 of those items, I think we've done 10, nine or 10 of them, and the other ones are under construction, just to, to make sure that although it feels daunting, what we have on our plate, as you look at our, our quote unquote to-do list for the next five years, that was on the end of that, we have made, uh, if not actually hit the mark, we've made significant progress towards it on every single one of those items. So one of the, I have, I have like two things I wanted to make sure I highlighted. One was we, we anticipated planning effort completions. And so thinking of Loxahatchee, of Lake Okeechobee, and of Western, you know, all those were discussed today. And, and we're teeing up the ones that, that we can for 2020. And then under the uh, recover, in, in mission areas, there's one part that I wanted to highlight under evaluation and planning. We talked about continuing to update our performance metrics and, and all the science that is needed in order for us to make progress. And so I'll just put in a plug for our, our scientists here at South Florida, at Fish and Wildlife Service, at Audubon, at the Corps, um, and at the Commission for putting together the update to the Lake Okeechobee stage PM. That has been years in the making, hasn't been updated since 2007, and it will go out for public review soon. So be on the lookout for that. Just thought I would end on that high note that we've made a lot of progress, and so I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Ava. On the CORE's report to Congress, looking around the table for comments and questions. Thank you for thank, thank you, you for that and the uh, handout on the timelines as well. Hmm. From here, we'll move into the public the morning public comment portion, and I'd like to encourage anybody that's filled out a card to come up to the. To, I'd like to encourage the, our speakers to come up to the podium and use the microphone. I'll call Michael Collins as our first speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I've got an issue with a later item. It's called IDS. Um, and my concern is you guys are going to do the presentation on IDS, and then we're going to have the public comment quite a bit later. And, you know, you're going to endorse it or move forward with whatever. So I just wanted to put it into the record that there's a timing issue on S356 that I've got a real problem with. And your call on whether you want me to give it all to you now or wait until after you've done your presentation. Uh, go ahead, while you're at the podium. Mm -hmm. All right, so the permit for S333 North calls for S356 to be built first. In your IDS now, there's a five-year gap. 333 North is supposed to be done five years before S356. This has gone on for a while. I don't really know what the problem is. But I can tell you, you're not going to be able to use a whole bunch of the components that you're building a plan for in COP if you don't have 356. I mean, it just it isn't going to work. And the reason we have the IDS, the reason that we put it in there, and I know that because I was there, is that these projects need to be able to come online as they're built. 
Now we have a reservoir upstream that has been moved up to the point where we're not going to have a conveyance system if we build it in the timeline that the politicians decided we want. I've always had a problem with that. I'm not going to go back into it now. But I would suggest you take a little look at the timing for those, considering that you've got a permit issue and then you've got a practical operational issue if you do it the way it's looking in the IDS right now. So I, maybe it's better I do it before and you folks can discuss it and figure out what's going on there as time goes on. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Next, we'll call it Nyla Pipes. Hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted to thank those of you that have been working so hard on WARP. I see a number of you around the table that I've also seen out in the field and at a number of smaller, intimate meetings with stakeholders really trying to work through the issues that have come to the table, the things that have been raised as concerns. I think there's still some very real concerns about water levels in some places. Um, but more importantly, I think that it's really good to acknowledge the extra work you've done even though we're so far into the planning process, even though the, the public participation portion of things, perhaps some of the stakeholders missed out on those early opportunities, I think it's really commendable the way that you're working forward through the issues that some of these stakeholders, the camp holders out there in the Big Cypress, et cetera, have brought to you. So I just encourage you to keep doing that because as we all know, Anytime we end up with issues with property owners and, and stakeholders, the true Floridians who may or may not live in this world all the time, right? The guys who are out there with their swamp buggies and, you know, the cattlemen who are out there with their cows doing what they do every day. Anytime we come up against problems with them on Everglades restoration, I find that a lot of the time it's because they've missed somewhere in the conversation that they were for lack of a better term, sort of on the chopping block, right? You've got people who own land in um, footprints of some of these projects. So I just think it's really great that you're working a little bit outside of the stiff meeting environment to get to those stakeholders and to work forward. Because if we don't have their support, then ultimately we lose support for all of this. And so that's really what I wanted to say. Just a positive thank you. Let's keep going. I know there's a way forward, and if I can be helpful in any way, I appreciate being there. I love doing it. Thanks. Thank you, Niall. And I had only two comment periods, only two commenters for this period, so we're a little bit ahead of schedule here. But I think what we'll do is we'll keep the agenda rack in order, and we'll go ahead and we'll take a 12 o'clock break for lunch today, and we'll reconvene at 1.
Gather around, folks. I'll call my chairs to the table. Co-chairs, come on up. Welcome all back from lunch. I see some coffee around the room and drinks. That'll help us. That'll help everyone to ward off that post-lunch dip. <laughs> um, Adam, I'll, I'll, we'll go right, right ahead and get started. I'll ask you to make some opening remarks for agenda item nine and set us off for the workshop here. Thank you. Yeah, watch out that you don't over-caffeinate yourself so you can actually talk. Um, so this afternoon's session is the, the, the part where we roll up our sleeves and uh, to, to quote Megan Jacoby all from this morning, to, to become troublemakers in some, in, in some way, shape, or form, because this is where we have to get some, get some work done and that we have a, a fearless approach to this afternoon's session. Um, regarding the integrated delivery schedule, what the task force has asked us to provide was options. That was what I heard. What, what are the options when it comes to the IDS? What the IDS currently represents is the best case scenario with the current funding based on they're having, they have that capacity. This is the maximum capacity that we have in order to achieve restoration. Um, and so for the IDS schedule, what we're looking for from you all is some guidance for the core in order to address the task force. This will be the first time, but not the last time that we will review this. The next time we get together, we will bring back that discussion for further review and then forwarding on that, that recommendation to the task force or some variation of that. We will be revisiting this IDS question. Um, what those options are is going to be up to you all to provide. Um, I, I enjoy the scientific exploration process so I'm not really interested at this point in putting bookends on, on my own personal thoughts on it as opposed to hearing from you all that represent your agencies, your organizations, and so forth on what that looks like. Um, so I'm going to stop there on the IDS. The, the uh, agenda, I, uh, James, anything to add on item nine for right now? Uh, no, no, we can continue okay. to discuss. Okay, all right, so at number, number 10, um, the task force top five action items. Um, you could probably go back and watch the task force and come away with top five blank and have four or five different responses of what those top five are. But what I'm going to, what I've interpreted it as um, is action items, actionable items, right? We're not talking about ones maybe necessarily that are um, on the priorities that we have, such as the exo uh, exotic species evasive strategic action framework. Uh, we already have those. We already have a, a, a way of discussing those. Um, what this looks like, again, I don't want to put necessarily bookends on you all, but challenges, interagency challenges. Do you all want to look at these as like some high-level buckets and then start filling in those buckets with item, agenda items? And, and how does this look like to bring those back to the task force for resolution um, of what those challenges might be? Um, is, it, is it always going to be funding? Is it, is it uh, policy issues? Is it, you know, water management issues? How do we resolve this? And again, just like the IDS, in, and specifically, um, both of these items were actually brought up um, by um, Mary Wayne and, and uh, Secretary Valenstein. So, and, and the chair, Dr. Petty, had forwarded it on for us to address, just like talking about WERP. So again, don't want to put some bookends on it, but we're going to have to have that fearless approach to talking about tough things. And that's where we have to put it up our sleeves and, and start trying to frame this up. And again, we'll come back to this topic again. This is the first blush at it, the first introduction of how, how you know, 
some of the thoughts regarding this and it's an open really an open forum so i kind of brought both of those together at one specific time to try to provide some some framework um, of where we're going with this um, and the oeri staff will be helping out with tracking some of these discussion points to try to help formulate the the ideas uh, that you all may may have regarding this so going back to the integrated delivery schedule i think that our, the program um, Bob, Bob, do you have anything to add on this, Johnson? Yeah. No. Ava, were you going to take it from this point? Is that where this was going to kind of review the IDS, the old one, or where we, not the old one, the current one? Excuse me. To kind of frame this up. Yeah, I grabbed a chair. I thought it might be a little easier. If that's all right. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Review what we have in front of us. Hmm. Yes. Yes. So Proceed. thank you. Yes. Um, on the on the table in front of you, you have what we call our baseline official IDS. It's the one that was rolled out at the task force in Octo on October 29th. And the task force um, wants to take a look at, can you hear me better this way? I will move it over. Thank you. The task force wants to maybe deliberate on what scenarios could be if funding is different than our baseline IDS. And our perspective together with the Water Management District, and uh, we get a lot of help from DOI as well, there's a lot of input here, that we will, we're the technical support, right? We have the tools to run the, the scenarios once we get that request for the task force scenarios. That's kind of how we're looking at this. We have this baseline. I thought that it might be helpful since this document is so weighty to kind of take a one or two minutes to look at what we have in, under construction for 2020 just to kind of refresh our memory. And then I'll be quiet and y'all can have a discussion about potential scenarios that the task force would then request the core and the water management district to run or one scenario. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm hearing an echo. Do you hear it? Yeah. Okay. So on the front page in 2020, we have our projected, you know, 200 million uh, federal budget, the 256 million state budget for a total of 456 million uh, dollars for 2020. Just to orient all of you, at the bottom of that front page, there's a, a legend that describes what each of those symbols means. The one that you're looking out for is a solid line, whether it's blue, which means the federal is the lead, or whether, I'm sorry, if it's blue, it's state. If it's black, it's federal. So if you see a solid line as we walk down 2020, those are all the projects that are under construction or would begin construction. So as we walk down that column, we see uh, that Herbert Hoover Dyke is under construction, Restoration Strategies is under construction, Kissimmee River. We have uh, the beginning of the conveyance portion of the Southwest Protection Features uh, for construction. Uh, road removal, ongoing construction for Picayune Strand, C44 Reservoir, C44 SDA and Pump Station, Caloosahatchee, uh, the C43 Reservoir, continuing construction, down to Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, L3, L31 East, which Howie talked about, Cutler Wetlands, which Megan talked about. That's just the front page. So as you deliberate on a scenario that the task force would want to request, I would want to make sure that you begin with that in mind, that what is already under construction would be something that we would continue. So the funds needed to continue construction would have to come off the, the, the beginning of the pile, so to speak, as you, as you deliberate about what kind of scenarios. Uh, we, we think that the sequencing and priorities that were set in the public workshops that many of you were a part of in 2015 uh, hold true here, and, and we would want that to continue. 
Um, and so as, as you flip the page to Central Everglades, which the whole, the whole back of this orange page is Central Everglades planning project. So uh, Central Everglades has SEP South, SEP North, and SEP New Water. So if you look at those bold, bold rows there that show the three portions of SEP, in 2020 we have uh, significant uh, improvements or, or progress with that. You know, you heard Megan talk to you about Old Tamiami Trail, which is blue. Um, in 2020, you have the structures in SEP South along the L67 that Howie talked about. Those are the ones that are uh, really um, key that we make the progress we need to make in combined operating plan. So, um, Mr. Chair, you, you asked Howie the question of unpacking the connections between COP and SEP, right? And so just giving you a very specific example here. When you're looking at that row that says structure 631 and structure 633, those two structures are part of SEP South in order for the Army Corps to begin construction as we expect that last quarter of 2020, which is that where that solid line begins, we must sign a project partnership agreement with the Water Management District. And in order to do that, part of that means environmental compliance that leverages combined operating plan. That's, that is a really specific connection of how the Army Corps plans to execute the 200 million in 2020 specific to SEP South, which is the beginning of SEP, and how that ties to COP. So as you move down, we've got an additional structure that's blue, which is S333N. I believe that was, I stepped out for a moment, I believe that was a subject of one of the discussions, one of the public comments, um, and so the, the comment that I, I understand is, is the concern of the operation of, S3, of S333N and uh, the, the beginning of S356 pump station. So just to, to orient you where that lives on the IDS, if you look at the row that says increase S356 pump station, we have design. It's black, so it's federal. We have design in 2020, 21, 22, with construction beginning in 2022. Construction of S-356 is expected to be a little lengthy because of where it is and because of its uh, proximity to S-334. And so even though not all pump stations take five years, this one we're, we expect to take a little bit of time. But just to make sure that you know where that lives on the IDS, we're talking about beginning construction in 2022 for S-356. The Water Management District began construction for S333N uh, last year. As you continue further down on 2020, construction is uh, shown for the EAA A2STA, and we've got design in earnest for the EAA Reservoir, which is that black line at the bottom of SEP. Any questions? All right. I don't know if I stumped everybody or I'll turn it back over to you. I did have one, this is Bob Rogalski, Fish and Wildlife Service. I did have one general question in the whole CORE's processing, this smart planning in three by three by three. Are all these, are, do we assume that all these meet those standard criteria for the, the, the smart planning that the Corps is doing, or are some of these likely, the planning efforts going to stretch further than those three years? What is the kind of the Corps' stance in terms of how we're processing uh, or planning for these CERT projects? That's a really good question. So the features don't make it onto the detailed portion of the IDS until we're done with that. So the ones that are in planning are on the front page under white. If you go to the front page at the bottom, the white portion, that is what's in feasibility study planning stage. 
it doesn't come up, which is why this IDS changed so much, is because it's when SEP, when the first time you see the very detailed view of SEP is this year. You had seen some of it last year, but when SEP was authorized in 2016, changed in 2018, then it comes up to the top, so to speak, and then the numbers show up at the top is after smart planning, after that, that phase. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ed. So uh, this is this is something that DEP we were challenged by NOAA uh, Secretary Valenstein to um, go ahead and start thinking about a while back um, before the task force meeting. He wanted us to kind of put our thinking caps on and, and see if there was a way we could create the alternatives, if you will. And um, one of the things we've, we've batted around an idea and something for consideration here, in order to not impact any of the, the project selection, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to touch with the prioritization. Uh, we think the prioritization is good, it's consistent, it's got a lot of public support behind it. We want to make sure that every project gets the attention that it deserves. So our thoughts were to work with the IDS as it is, but then create the alternatives based off of like the last five years average, you know, come up with an average funding. And instead of trying to come to a specific project by project, but look at Okay, so the IDS as it is, we get X projects complete by X time, and it's with X dollars. Now we take that average dollars, and we say that is a percentage less than what is on this IDS, so we can make a gross assumption that if it takes us 10 years to get a project and it's 100 million, and now in reality we're only getting 10 million, so we would multiply that time out by 10 years. And th that's just a gross, you know, example for, for right now, but that's kind of where we were thinking that you could come up with alternatives that say, okay, here's the average we've received state and federal over the last five years. And if we got this level of funding, here's how it impacts the timeline for getting those projects complete. So that way we can communicate the importance to our, to the state legislature this is why it's so important that you keep the funding at the level because if you back it down, here's how you push out Everglades restoration and you don't get those projects completed in the timely manner they need to be completed. So that's just kind of an idea. We haven't put pencils to paper yet, unfortunately. I wish I had done that and had something to bring today, but um, that's kind of our thoughts, just one idea that came to mind. And the idea was try not to mess with that scheduling. We don't want to mess with the order in which we do projects, but just show how funding changes stretch out timelines. And, and of course, there's always the, you know, we're having to make some big assumptions. We know that dollar for dollar time doesn't work out. Like if you get 50% less dollars, it doesn't double your time to do a, a project. It could move it even further than double. And, and ultimately it could increase the cost, or it will increase the cost, the overall cost of the project. So we would need to just make sure that those assumptions were clear in our whatever alternatives we came out with. That this is just a gross estimate and that there would be other implications that would happen by this. So just a thought. Ed, thank you very much. That was a, a great entry to this topic and a really good way to frame up the discussion. Um, let's look around the table for some other ideas. And James? So I would agree with everything Ed said. Um, I think it's a little difficult to look at funding scenarios with a static placement. I think this is a great tool, you know, for showing stakeholders or showing policymakers. But maybe we should think about using an online tool or some way to, you know, look at what, what happens to the schedule based on the existing priorities um, and, you know, look at it based on, you know, if, if you're getting a third less funding that year, this is what the schedule looks like, and we can carry that out. And I think maybe, you know, maybe you're going to have to do that online. It won't be, 
you know, a static placemat. Um, otherwise, we'd have 20 different placemats we'd be handing out. I think it would be, you know, something to consider. Um, and, I, and I think NOAA does that with, like, the sea level rise projections. You can plug those in and have numbers where you could plug in funding levels for each year, and it'll kind of give you an idea of what that timeline looks like. So something to consider. Thank you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue going around the table here, but I want to make sure I open the invitation to the co-chairs here to jump in at any time. Um, and while we're talking about the change, you brought up a very important point, and that is the audience. And I think as in this discussion, we should keep in mind and frame out who the audience would be for, uh, for another version of this, for, for an alternative scenario placement. We had some hands over yeah, here. Yeah, um, this is Dave Rodnick. Uh, I, I just want to put the kind of the scientific context, some scientific context to our discussion of project schedule changes. Um, you know, while, while if we extend schedules, um, that doesn't stop sea level rise effects that, which are accelerating. So the, la the landscape is changing literally under our feet. <laughs> um, and there, the, there's, there was a logic to the sequence. I, I don't, also don't want to disrupt and re-argue that sequence. Yet it may be that um, the, the real world changes require us to reevaluate some elements of that. Not all of these, uh, the distribution of, of ecological effects and societal effects of uh, just, I'll just do sea level rise, but of course there's other, there are other dynamics at play, um, don't affect these projects equally or there are resources equally. So I, I think we, we really have to, you know, this, this, is, this is not a simple accounting exercise. Um, the effectiveness, the, success, the level of success of SERP, what, what, we, what the level of success we realize depends on these decisions. And we, have, if we, we need to take into account mm -hmm. sea level rise, climate change, other unmanaged uh, factors. Dave, along those lines, uh, capturing that would be will be a challenge, but I think it, it, you're right. If we could capture that in a scenario, how the environment and those conservation benefits, those ecological benefits are not achieved on track, if we could capture that somehow, it would be, it would be very powerful. Just to add, we, um, an attempt within, there's an attempt within Recover to develop a system-wide vulnerability analysis. That's an example of having a decision support tool mm -hmm that can help guide these kinds of decisions. Unfortunately, we're, we're late on that. I mean, it would have been good if we had it 10 years ago. Um, it's in development. Uh, it, and we've been warned by the CISRA, uh, at least some members of the panel, in advance of their, their uh, next report, that uh, that kind of analysis can take quite a bit more time. Mm -hmm. So we, I think we, we may need to find some ways to expedite that kind of um, decision support, mm -hmm. not, not necessarily that uh, completing that modeling analysis for this, but uh, having that kind of information, being informed for, the, for this set of decisions, I, I don't know that we, anything is more important than IDS as far as uh, set, setting our course uh, wisely. Mm -hmm. Ava? So thinking of that, I wonder whether it might help to take a look at it the way we presented it at task force, which was by region. If you recall, just to pick one of the, one of the indicators, there are so many, uh, it's overwhelming really, as we look at this, the scientific indicators. One of the, the pieces of information that, or the new literature that came out in the last few years was that concept of the freshwater head, right? Um, I know that it was um, supported by all the many years of work about about uh, peat and, and and collapse of peat. But as you look at this IDS, it represents six six point one billion dollars in the next ten years. That's what this IDS represents. As we presented it at task force, we broke out the using the same regions that the system status report uses, and four billion of the six billion is in the Greater Everglades which has the most uh, impact to protecting that freshwater head. 
and, and which is our number one mitigating strategy for sea level rise. And so I would say that you've got that baked into here right now. Um, whether we find ways to better or more clearly or more, more transparently articulate that, maybe, maybe we can do that, but, but that's baked in here uh, just to make sure that everybody was tracking that. Come over here to Chad, and then we'll go back to Ed. Mm -hmm. All right, Chad Kennedy, DEP. Uh, I guess I had a few comments about it, and I just wanted to revisit that this tool, and I, James, I hear your point as far as like having a more dynamic tool where you could actually kind of change the numbers on the fly. Um, and maybe this is just my bureaucratic uh, uh, thing. I like the sheet of paper because this gives me, it grounds me. And I think this thing is intended to ground us and kind of keep us all like this this is our this is our our big picture mm -hmm. vision of the future as far as how we're moving forward so as far as having something that we manipulate more rapidly on the fly I, I'm concerned about that because I've seen things the next shiny object is, is a problem with anything and SERP's no exception and I like having this thing where it is a little more static for until we can figure things out and to speak to Dave's point as far as like Sea level rise, yes. We know things are going to change, and we can pull this off the shelf at any time and adjust it. Now, identifying the, the ecological triggers to justify that adjustment, that's a whole other discussion. But as uh, Ed mentioned, it does make sense the sequencing on this. There's been a lot of people working very hard on that, and I, it, it, I don't see any compelling reason to change the sequence of how we're, we have the projects organized now. The one thing I did notice on this, it was a dramatic change, and I think it was done with all good intentions, was the, the dollar amounts jumped exponentially at the top of the page. And I think it, that kind of set us up, and if you look at it from a, and, I'll, and I'm not a politician, but if I was someone in, in that type of position, it's like, well, you know, let's set the, and I don't want to say it, but if you set expectations a little lower, you're more likely to exceed the expectation. I, it's just a, a zero-sum game. So that was my first thing that I noticed on this is that, and I think the intent was good to have these high optimistic numbers. It's like, if you give us this much money, we will get this done. But I can see where as a policymaker say, you know, we have a lot of other people that have their hand out as well. Maybe we should set the bar a little more conservatively on what we expect to do in the future and maybe do, and do it based on, you know, inflation rate, 3% or something like that. It's a little more, not such a dramatic uh, climb in the next few years. Um, that would be my one observation. And the other is I know the Corps' planning process is your budgets are like already two years down the road. So you guys already have, is that my understanding? So you're, you're already down this path, so to speak. We're, we're already in 2001 for you right now. I'm presuming you guys already kind of have a vision. We're starting 2021. All right. So right that, that to me is relevant to this um, as far as like where we start to make adjustments. Um, because you've already kind of, you're already on the track, the train is on the track, so to speak, for the core on certain aspects of this. But um, that was my observation is the, the amount of money, it, it, it seems like if we stick to this one sheet, that would be the one thing I think we probably need to focus on is, is, is kind of bring that back down. We've had a really great year, but let's, let's kind of temper that optimism a little bit. So Ed Smith, DEP. Um, Two, two things. One, Dave, I, you, you're absolutely right. We do need to make sure that we are reflecting you know, sea level rise. And I think we can do that with the example that I gave because NOAA has done a great job of putting out this predictor that shows, okay, in you know, X number, in 20 years, this is the expected sea level rise. So we could put markers on this that show, okay, if you push this out 40 years, here is your expected level of sea level rise and you know we can kind of map that out on this with markers to show that you know I think we could do that but I think also to your point I don't, you didn't quite say but I think it's there that there are other things that are going to happen there's other ecological losses that we, we'll have to figure out how to get that on there so I, you, you mentioned that James and then Chad kind of answering what you're saying on DEP against DEP the um, the idea that we got from the task force was keep this like this so that the policymakers can see what it's going to take to get their vision done 
and then give them one or two alternatives. You give them the one that's the worst case scenario, which is I call the last five year average. And that's, that's kind of our worst case scenario. And then you build another alternative that may be kind of threading the needle in there. So when they go to meet with those policymakers, they can present the IDS, they can present the other alternatives and go pick your poison, you know, and just kind of put it on them to make the choice and understand the consequences of their choices. So to address sea level rise, to address the timeline, and you can even put caveats in there about how it's going to increase the cost. You know, we know that there's what about a 3% increase in cost for every year you delay construction. So we can we can put those caveats into this also. And it, it'd be a great tool for people that have to go and meet with the policymakers to take and say, this is why it's so important that we get all the support we can get. And these are scary numbers. Yeah, that, those are big, scary numbers. But you won't get it if you don't ask for it. And if you don't have an alternative that shows them if they give you this, here's what happens. You're going to get that, and they, they're, they're not going to get to see what happens. And then it's going to be your fault because you didn't tell them before. So um, I think that's just the – those are my takeaways from that. So thanks, Jane. Nick? Yeah, I just want to make a couple comments I, about the IDS in general. I mean, it is our best shot at our priorities right now, but it will change. There is no doubt the IDS will change, right, because mm -hmm. things change – under our feet all the time. I mean, I, I wrote a couple of them down. We know the environment's changing, right? We, Dave mentioned sea level rise. We know that the threats that face us will change for Everglades restoration. We know the politics change all the time. You know, that the, everything affects us. Everything will affect, everything that does affect this IDS and the way that we think about prioritization will change, no matter how we depict it. That's just a reality. But I think what we have to keep in mind as a backdrop to this is the threats are not, at least at the current time, they're not going away. Many of them are accelerating in their severity and their sort of time frame. And so in a, as we do our, our plea and our selling job for dollars, that's got to be an important underlying foundation that the longer that we, we wait, the more difficult an already difficult job becomes. And I also just want to also mention, I know we, we mentioned sea level rise as an example, but that's not the only thing that we have to think about. We've, I've talked about this before possible changes in long-term precipitation patterns, other things that have potentially big impacts on what we're trying to do. Bob? Well, I, first I want to I want to give a word of encouragement that I think we really did match the proposed sequencing to the threats well, because what you all have to acknowledge when you look at the report card and it tells you where we're scoring the lowest the projects that fix that are the ones that are on here to push us forward. So I think that's a message we all have to carry. And, I, and I, the fact that this looks like a seven-year mortgage with a big balloon payment comes is because we know what happened. We did not do the payments for the first X number of years at $400 million like we said we were supposed to. And now we're caught in this situation where we still have to pay for the foundation projects and the generation one and two projects, which should have been done already as we're going into the next set of projects. We got so far behind, this is what happened. Okay, don't pay us now. What do you think it's gonna look like next time? It's only gonna get worse. So you, at some point, we have to figure out how to catch back up. And you don't catch back up by dropping below where we are. If we, you know, hate to say it, but if we look at the schedule before this and the dollars we got, that's what led us to the balloon payment. Look, go back a year or two and look at the cash flow. And that explains why it's so big. But I, I think Ed's point is exactly right. If we don't show what it's going to take, I'll say, to get the project back on track, then this is our fault. We didn't bring the information forward to say how we correct it. We don't have 40, 50 years to wait. That, that's a good point. I'd like to add in that if we, it, we should think carefully about a low, medium, and high scenario because people might have a tendency to gravitate towards the medium scenario in that. Um, Chris? It's a... <clears throat> One of the things that, that we haven't really talked about, we've been talking around it, is the criteria of how we sequence projects. And I think laying those out really well would be the first step in, in figuring out whatever scenario we go with. Um, and the, the sea level rise discussions got me got you thinking about it and most familiar with the coastal systems and like Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands is one of those projects where 
it's and it would give us benefits against sea level rise because sea level rise is a slow process is punctuated by major events like hurricanes that cause dramatic losses and Biscayne Bay Coastal West Lens is to protect against that. However, if we wait too long to do it, we won't be able to do it and, and, it, it, and there'll be losses like that. So we need to think about those types of criteria that we need to make sure we include when we think about sequencing and think about, especially as we prioritize low, medium, and high in a limited budget, what are the things that we absolutely have to do right away? Adra? No, no, no. Go ahead, sir. More important. Uh, no, please. <laughs> no, 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 please. <laughs> no, I, I, I really appreciate this conversation and, and listening to it. Uh, and, and Nick, you're right on in terms of, you know, the, the, the threats. Uh, they change over time. Uh, when people ask me what my main concern is uh, at the park, at uh, any of the units for that matter, uh, I always, res always respond the same way, which is I'm not as concerned as, uh, as I may have been years ago with uh, restoration needs because I, I think that there's a lot of emphasis and momentum behind it that I feel confident that we'll get it done. There's clearly a lot of fine-tuning and a lot of uh, work ahead of us, but I feel good about it. I don't feel as good, and my response quickly goes to exotics, exotic invasions of plants and animals. And, you know, that's one thing that hasn't really been represented all that well in the work that, that, that we do. We've been really focused on... Uh, the hydrology a piece of uh, the work that, that we have to complete. A, I remember going to an event, a, I forget where it was, in Fort Lauderdale, uh, where we released some bugs that are supposed to eat our weeds. And uh, one of my comments was that a, we need to make sure that we don't end up restoring the Everglades for a whole bunch of weeds and animals that don't belong here to begin with. And I'm afraid that, uh, much like what Bob was saying, uh, if we don't figure out a way, uh, whether it comes from ideas around this table and emphasis from the task force and their support or elsewhere, uh, we're going to be so far behind the ball someday, not only with respect to this invasion of snakes, which is what typically gets most of the attention. But, you know, we've got something like 55,000 acres worth of uh, uh, pepper uh, in Everglades National Park in a very, very remote area, and it is mind-boggling for us to think about how we're going to really tackle that so that when we restore the system and ultimately bring the water that the park needs, we've got an environment there that can benefit from it and then thrive. Uh, I don't know how that fits into the conversation. We're just brainstorming, and I'm just putting it out there. Uh, and while I have the mic, I'll also uh, you know, express my concern that in none of these li lists, uh, I see uh, the concern of seepage at the eastern part of our boundary addressed. And uh, I know that there is a letter that the delegation here, uh, the two senators and a congressman sent to R.D. James uh, with respect to uh, concerns related to flood control in South Dade in particular. Uh, and I think that uh, a secondary benefit to the concern that our delegation is expressing in that letter, encouraging R.D. James to find a way to use hurricane funding to address that uh, flood control issue in that part of the system. A secondary benefit uh, of it would be making sure that the water stays in the park. All this water that we are trying to move south, 80% of it keeps moving out of the park. And, uh, and we don't have a project to do that. You know, we, we want to drink of the jug, 
but we're not patching the big hole that the jug has in it. We keep filling it up, and we just don't have enough to drink, and we won't until we patch that hole. Uh, so, you know, those two things are things that, that concern me a lot, that I think, a, whether around this table or at a different table, a, I'm looking to address it. Mr. Chair, I, I wanted to add to what Mr. Ramos was saying about seepage management because I think that's one of the things that has the most consensus how needed it is. I wanted to point out that if you look at the second page, there is under SEP new water, a portion of that is considered, but not all of it. And so the portion Mr. Ramos is talking about is in addition to what is in this idea. So I just wanted to make sure if you're looking at it and you wonder where does that reconcile, it's because it's an additional consideration of seepage management that everybody recognizes needs to be done. But there is a seepage barrier within the IDS that was part of SEP New Water that will be um, under design with South Florida. Just wanted to make sure you guys are tracking that. Thank you. One thing I'd like to point out as we're wrapping this part of the part of the workshop up is the document is extremely informative and it has a lot of information in it. And if you've ever spent the time to walk through it and explain it to somebody, which I'm sure many people around the room have to their board members, councilmen, elected officials, um, it, it takes some time. And, and, and it's fairly complicated at that, but it shows we have a well thought out, well planned road map to get to a solution to get those conservation and ecological benefits. In, in looking at a scenario, alternate scenarios with less funding, I think personally simplified <coughs> might be more useful for communicating to that audience. Whereas we've got this high level of funding, we have this really great road map for it, and if the funding was at that, worst case scenario that Ed pointed out on the average of the last five years, what would it look like? Um, and I'm not sure what that matrix is, whether it was a percent of completion, whether it's all of the projects dialing back on some level of assumptions that were made, but some way that simplifies that to communicate that if it's not done, this is where we land. Um, I think that's a big ask, but that, that would be useful, definitely. Mm -hmm. John? And then Rebecca. Oh, the, Rebecca, ladies first. Um, Rebecca Elliott, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And, and I agree that it, as a tool to be able to show what happens if funding is decreased, it needs to be simplified to the point where you're not trying to explain, you know, why this is here now, why that's there now, you know, mm -hmm. based on reduced funding. So, you know, I would support that idea for communication. Um, but as we're saying, things change. Yeah. And I think if the funding really were to be reduced, we would be sitting around this table talking about what the priorities are for the funding that's actually available. Um, the IDS is a roadmap, but it's not set in stone. It's a work in progress. And one of the things that does come to mind for me is this, you know, S333 North and how soon it's going to be finished compared to S356. There's a six-year gap in there, and, and it's unfortunate because, you know, you want to get the full benefits of the projects that you do and what their potential is to actually deliver the water. And that will be limited, that, you know, the, the potential for the new S333 North. Um, again, it's just going to be limited until you get S356 online. So I think if you were making, if you're going to have to reprioritize, that's the kind of thing that you would want to be looking at is, you know, really what sequence makes the most sense to get the most benefits where they're needed. And, you know, again, I really support a simplified approach for an alternative at this time. But I also think, you know, everyone just needs to keep their eye on, you know, what happens in the future and what the best plans will be going forward with what we really have to work with. John? John Mayo, Martin County. Thank you, Jim. I want to 
um, build on the oversimplification argument a little bit. Now, being from Martin County, I know I'm supposed to just say IRL South, and, and that's the most important project. We need to do that tomorrow, and, and I, I'll stand by that. But, but I do want to say that if, if the context of the conversation we're having is about how we message the importance of the federal funding to, to this effort, um, I, sometimes, so, so these are wonderful, and we love them. Whenever we get an update, we laminate these, and everybody in the office wants a copy. We carry them around D.C. with us. But what it, what it kind of has the effect of is focusing on the individual projects. It almost actually looks like a rat race, only the losers are out front, and the, the winners are, are, in, are, are trailing behind geographically. Um, and so when we go and we advocate for federal spending on these, we tend to focus on the projects that our constituents are concerned with, and, and our delegates tend to pick up that focus. And at some point, um, all that has to coalesce into one number, right? So I remember this exercise from my days in state parks where we had um, all of the uh, state park managers from 176 state parks in one room, and our friends groups that support those groups are deeply committed to their parks, they're deeply committed to um, to those specific areas, and we were talking about how we effectively advocate for funding of operation of state parks and capital improvements. And we did this exercise where they had us all yell out uh, the name of the park that we represented. And of course, it comes as no surprise, it sounded like noise. You, you know, you couldn't make out any one thing. And then they had us all yell out Florida State Parks, and it came across as a very clear and resounding message that someone could grab hold of. So I wonder if um, there wouldn't be, uh, a useful feature in our toolbox for advocating this just a number that if we fund it at this level we finish Everglades restoration in 20 whatever if we fund it at this level we finish Everglades restoration 20 or 30 whatever um, just to make it ultra simple something we can all coalesce mm -hmm. around and and we don't necessarily always get into the weeds about who wins and loses when allocating dollars mm -hmm. Ava so I wonder whether some of that might be helpful in, in the six billion in ten years or you know, that that high, whether you're whether that would be helpful because it doesn't say the IDS doesn't say six billion for the next ten years. But those are the types of sound bites that are helpful, right? Uh, if we get six billion in ten years, this is what this means. If we get three, this is what this means. And I wonder whether that's was that where you were going? Or maybe even finer than that. I mean, I think that's in the direction of what I'm thinking. But I'd like to be able to say, if we're funding it at our 67 million a year from the federal government, that it's going to take till 2075 to finish Everglades restoration. But if you made it 200, I'd like to be able to say it's 2045, whatever those numbers are. Yeah, it's kind of finish it in your lifetime or finish it in somebody else's lifetime, right? So, so if this is a roadmap, right? A roadmap is supposed to take you to a destination. My kids aren't asking me when are we going to be at at the next gas station, they're asking me, when are we going to be at the destination? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the number I'd love to be able to report. Yeah. Adam? A few words to bring us in for a close? Well, first, I don't want to cut it off um, at any one time at an appropriate location as ideas may evolve. You know, we may come back at this and want. But, you know, when I didn't want to put any bookends on this, what we're asking the court to do is a lift here. Right. There, there is, you know, a, a, a time and a resource investment of their labor that takes away from something else. So I didn't want to put that out there as a framing component when we go into this. But it, when we go down this road, um, they've, you, you saw the work that Howie presented on. You saw the work that Megan presented on. That takes people behind that. And and although Obviously, if we don't get the funding, we don't get the projects. How do we message the funding? How do we effort the time? And how do we, you know, it's, it's that contextual, continual, uh, you know, dueling battle that we, that we have and balancing act. And, you know, from what, you know, maybe I misheard, right? I, um, James, I'd like you to send me the link for NOAA if you know and have it accessible. You know, because one of the comments from um, Secretary Valenstein was, you know, he wants this updated every year. You know, is, is that really possible? 
you know, and, and, and he's just letting ideas flow, right? So how do we be, we be responsive to that request? It's not, no, we can't do that, or no, or, and, and not finish it off. Is there maybe something long-term? I find that some of those things, and I get it, that it's, it's great to have a hard copy. You can, you can tug on it, you can look at it, you can scroll across, you can get your piece of paper. Sometimes I might lose it on my screen. I'd only, you know, I only have one screen on my computer and not two. And, um, so, you know, I'd like to try to get to some kind of resolution here to provide the core with some considering, you know, options about how to frame this up. Um, so, as to give them some guidance to, to go forward, it seems like we're all in agreement that we need to understand what that other bookend is. This, this is one bookend. Would that be correct, Eva? Baseline. Yes. Yes. This is this is one of the other bookends, and do we need to look at that other bookend and go with a five-year average as opposed to pulling a single number out of our hat, right? And and um, I don't know if the secret sauce, given that the secret sauce makes actual sense, Chris, um, you know, because that sauce may change over time as we add in climate change and how somebody may misinterpret somebody's subjective change. In general, I think we all agree with this. Um, and and um, moving forward, and not to belabor to where we need to get to close this out, but you know, Rebecca, I think that maybe your item of what you're talking about is for item number ten on the agenda, right? Those challenges that we face, right? And 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 going back to the comments here, you know, the IDS sequencing may be for the the, the number ten. So I don't want to brush over. I'm trying to touch on everybody's points here. Can we can we come to some kind of an idea here about what that other bookend can be? Can it be a bookend with possibly a, an evaluation of doing something that Mr. Evans, as a long term, maybe goal that's not necessarily in the near term, to have something that maybe addresses uh, Secretary's other comments? I don't know. I'll throw that out there and stop. Thank you. Uh, just a moment, James. I, I, what John was saying about a single number is very useful, and what, Jane, what you were saying about a, a tool. Also very useful, but we do run the risk of having a, a tool with everybody using different numbers and different communication going out, which is a problem in itself. James? Yeah, and I just wanted to kind of go back to what Ed said. Um, I agree with what Ed and Chad said. I think it is, is nice to have, you know, a piece of paper that shows you, you know, what's going on, and we can use that from year to year. The challenge you have is if you're doing a new one every year, you're going to have projects that slip, and, and that you know, that goes unnoticed. You're going to see projects slip and, you know, you get your new IDS schedule this year and you see the C43 reservoir slip two years on the schedule, but then we move on. And so I think this idea of having like three scenarios, maybe a 2065 option, a 2045 option, and this 2030 option, you can still use those numbers. It gives you the hard copy that you can look at and you can show the policymakers or your constituents or whatever it might be what happens in these different scenarios and you still have that hard copy and so it's not it's not changing but you can see when you compare those different schedules how those projects might slip from the 2030 2045 or 2065 scenarios so just something to think about but i was just recommending the tool the online tool as a way for people to kind of visualize those changes but if we can do it with three different placemats um i think that might work ed just real quickly, just to, that we, I think that's a great idea, but I think we need to be very careful about, because I know the core and the district, they already sort of tried this exercise, doing it, following it exactly with the projects and the timelines and everything. It became extremely cumbersome mm -hmm. and it, it just didn't work out. It, it, it's, it's very challenging. Building this itself is a very long project, so if we're building three of them or two of them, it's, it's a very, the staff that build this are the same staff that are doing the projects. So we don't want to pull too much time away. That's why I was coming up with a, like John was saying, high level. Just keep it high level. And you can show slippage. You may not be able to get to the fine grain of, oh, C43 just went out a year, or C43, you know, you can get it back a year or whatever. But you can show overall, and that's, that's to where we get the sea level rise, we get the ecological indicators, we can show if you fund it at this level, this is what we can avoid. If you don't fund it at this level, this is the consequences. And so just some word of caution about trying to get to that fine level of staff time and what you actually get out of it. Thank you. A few decisions go into creating it, right? <laughs> 
about a million. Chad? Okay. Rebecca? If you, if you are picking a funding level to put in, you know, for the years, I think it should be based on something like Ed's saying, like a five-year average mm -hmm. or even the 400 that was anticipated. So I think whatever number is chosen, it ha you, you should have some reference to it that, that it would be credible, that they would say, okay, that makes sense mm -hmm. using that. Yeah, you got to start sketching some. You put one of those little hash marks in there that shows a break on the x-axis. Mm -hmm. Oh, just looking around the room. See, I, I think this one's kind of, we're seeing some, coalesc some coalescing here around, around the one number idea, I think, is what I'm here, what I'm seeing and hearing. Um, and how that's applied to the, how that's applied to the, to the actual IDS here. I think there's a decision process in that, and I'd invite the, either the core or anyone else at the table to comment on that, um, or reserve those comments as it's thought about a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do think, as was asked, that the ask of the task force was to look at how that funding level would affect these projects, and very important to look at that because it's that timeline again it goes back to what we were saying it's it, it, it's in the, in these years in this lifetime or in some other lifetime when you're talking about these projects as everything continues to slip mm. any closing remarks Adam on this one I think we'll bring this one in for a landing and we does let's ask the court Eva do you think you have enough information right now from this discussion or perhaps we can count on our folks at the OERI staff to distill this a little bit and help us with the next steps and distill these comments down into some more uh, beneficial or useful information for you to work off of so I like that she has seven pages of discussion mm -hmm. um, that's very helpful I I think we will need both South Florida because it, it isn't just us uh, right. there's a very significant uh, effort with South Florida as well as DOI um, because there's a lot of different projects in here mm -hmm. that the the definition of that task force requested scenario is is what would be really helpful to us so that we can meet the need I think Ed was doing a really good job of explaining Secretary uh, Ballenstein's request and and I I like that high level perspective I think that's getting to what everybody's wondering right um, because as I look at it, I look at the six billion over ten years, and then you look at the white bar, you know, and you've got Loxahatchee, which is seven hundred and fifty million, Laco is two billion, uh, Western is, is about one, one point three. I'm, I'm forgetting that one for a moment. But as you look at that, you know, you, you've got projects in the queue that are going to add to that six billion dollar right. bill. Um, and that six billion, by the way, isn't including the blue part on the top. So as we look at what scenarios or what scenario it would be helpful for that to be defined, you know, it, the high level I think would be the most helpful. Bob? Yeah. Bob Rogalski, Fish and Wildlife Service. One real small detail that I was looking through here and I was just thinking about discussion. What, what, how do you see the generic question of work? It still says work was anticipated to be um, authorized in word of 2020. Is that still, I mean, I know there's some interim activities going on right now. I'm just curious of what the plan is for that, if, if there's anything definitive. Yeah, we, we missed 2020. For work, that's an updated. Thank you for catching that. That's an update that that is needed for the IDS. It doesn't even last 30 days. You publish it and <laughs> stuff changes. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, that that 2024 work was missed. You're welcome. And then and then to build upon that question, these these projects on the bottom, they're are they in the dollar sign up there at the top? They are not. They are not. That <laughs> would once those go to Worda, then they come up. To the dollars right. right so it's it's what's been authorized and we've got PPAs or PPA is coming 
that's what's in that number. So these are real, what do we have on the books? Mm -hmm. And then we've got another, you know, four billion going to Warda, and we'll have a little bit more after that. Yeah. So my, personally, I think, you know, you, you were mentioning talking in terms of is a six billion dollars over this time period. I think the annual discussion is very useful from what I was hearing here too in the room because the annual discussion is what we're probably likely to be communicating with legislators and legislators uh, or other decision makers about um, that over multiple year cycle is very important, but I will tend to talk to somebody about, you know, the fund, right now it's about funding for $200 million per year at the federal level for Everglades restoration. It's not $6 billion over a number of years. Um, so that, that, that annual, that in, in any simplified version, that annual number, might, it was still very useful, I think. Sorry, so do you have enough to provide some guy provide back to us or provide back to the working group that number five year or four hundred million dollars is that something that you guys can move on from we can move on from this agenda item are we comfortable are you comfortable I'm comfortable with uh, having another discussion with Alan and Ed and, and mm -hmm. fine-tuning the notes yes okay yes gotcha I don't know that I yet know exactly what the oh, scenario okay. is going to be but I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm trying to look at my boss, yes. right? My boss is going to be asking for something for the next task force. So I'm just trying to you understand got that, right? So, yep. uh, but that doesn't necessarily, it's not the same one as yours. So appreciate it. Um, so, oh, so, oh. so Adam, I will, I will commit me to getting at least like a rough sketch of what I think it should look like to Ava and DOI, Alan. And we can all work on it off based off I'm taking notes and I drew a picture and this is what I'm, I'm thinking it should look like so I will I'll get this in a more pretty form and get it to you ASAP mm -hmm. I appreciate everybody's effort at this point we obviously knew I stated at the beginning of this we'd be re, re uh, reevaluating this revisiting this at, at our next joint working group there may be information interimly mm -hmm. to review uh, we'll see where it goes, and I think we can probably move on and wrap yeah. this one up unless anybody has any further final comments. And Pedro, your comments, I think, maybe for this next one, right, um, in relationship to exotics. Yeah. So. And, and before we go, I'll just thank Ava for participating in the discussion and, and walking us through this, and Ed for your volunteering to take, a, take kind of a rough cut at that. And I think as we go forward, working together, we'll get us to the solution we're looking for. Hmm. Item 10. Item 10. I find item 10 now. Uh, Task Force 5, top 5 um, action items, challenges, what have you. I think we yes. may have chewed around some of these topics. Um, uh, Rebecca had spoken about the IDS. Maybe that's a topic um, separate from what we were just talking about. Maybe that's a challenge that we have. Maybe there's more to the 356, 333 North, um, you know, how do we frame up the exotics discussion? Um, and, um, you know, maybe it's, you maybe you need assistance because it's a conflict between state and federal and local of the glyphosate issue. I made a, a note up about that we need to kind of have a discussion about from an ecosystem restoration standpoint that the task force may be able to help with resolution or messaging on these topics, um, you know, is funding one of those um, challenges? Yeah, uh, yes it is. Um, is that something for the task force necessarily to specifically address? Mm, maybe you all may find that, that that's not really what this item is about as you have a discussion and review. It may be that it's those areas where we have conflict between federal, state, and local partners, um, you know, in, in what we're talking about here, um, a misunderstanding. Um, this is really when, um, you know, I've got uh, Dash, Megan, Jacoby, 12, 4, 19, troublemakers uh, shall arise, 
right? And, and um, you know, this is where it gets done. It's uh, the, the tough discussions we've been trying to work through. I know I've been trying to work through some of our issues of Miss, you know, the 333s being shut off, trying to work at why that is, or other picky you and strand matters on water quality. You know, wh where are some of these projects at that we're resolving, um, and that there's not another framework or another pathway to, to facilitate that. You know, we have different pathways to have discussions. We've got the exotic framework that comes through here. We've got water quality. Um, you know, consent decree related items at the TOC, that's a pathway for that discussion to happen. You know, what are those other hanging subject matter that are preventing us from maybe taking that next step? That's, that's what I interpret from, from listening to the folks, and that's my interpretation, and you all may have others, and I, I appreciate everybody's last discussion and how that evolved, and, and there seemed to not seem, there seemed to be some you know, resolution and consistency across the board. So I'll stop there. Um, Adam, this is Alan from behind you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, quick question regarding this um, request from the task force. Was there a time frame window that they were wanting us to, is this short term, long term, all the terms? Is there some type of, I know you don't want to put firm bookends, but is there a framework to guide the discussion time wise? as far as what the products are that we put on the list to take back to them are they, they want it every single task force they want the top five items time crunching most immediate right gotcha uh, that's what i that's what my interpretation was um i don't have uh the audio clips from this specific i was focused on the ids um when grabbing audio clips um my uh, slips my head what i was trying to remember there uh, as you were talking about timeline. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll come back to me. Adam, I'll jump in. One of the things that was mentioned by um, Vice Chair, Vice Chair Valenstein was uh, tracking. Things that the task force should be tracking and things they can be effective at. So um, in terms of timeline, I think it goes both near term and potentially longer term. If it's something the task force wants to track over a longer term, that's attached to the progress. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Now I just finally remembered what I was talking about. So if we if we bring five items every task force back, probably get nothing else done, because each one of these items may have a presentation that will need to be made by one of you or somebody on your team to bring the task force up to speed so they can have a meaningful discussion. So whether or not this is one or two or three, you know, how we lay this up, I see this being an iterative, more iterative process that's going to depend on you all and not necessarily so much the core, the OARI, putting this up in a spreadsheet, putting them in different buckets. But we have to also manage that time that we have with the task force. I don't see us going to three or four or five task force meetings a year just for the sake of, of this topic. But I think when you're kind of framing up your expectations of what we're putting in and what we're getting out is the limitations that we have and how we prioritize the time of, of presentations and information. With that, let's go to the group. And I think we're working here. Ultimately, we may have more than five items on this list, but we will work with, uh, with the staff at OERI to distill it down and try to get to five. So let's hear from both science coordination team members and, of course, working group members here. Start with Dave. I'll take the easiest, low-hanging uh, suggestion, which, which Pedro already described, which is, uh, and, and Mike Collins' comment too, it's basically the uh, seepage management issue. Since it's not completely ca uh, captured within our existing projects, and even the 356 uh, expanded capacity is uh, delayed, perhaps, as, as Mike suggested. Um, it, you know, what do, we, what do we do about that? I don't know. I don't know how we incorporate that into, uh, fold it into SEP South or a standalone project, uh, perhaps some state, state initiative for part and some federal initiative for part. But uh, COP itself um, will be, uh, its uh, effectiveness will be impeded still by um, the existing uh, seepage management uh, deficiencies. It's been a, a constraint within, a clear constraint in our development of COP, We're trying to protect particularly South Data Ag while 
improving uh, Taylor Slough area in Florida Bay. So, um, you know, this, this always comes up, Bay and Hipscoe Mile area is, is, is always a problem. So it's, it's the entire eastern boundary, though, not um, a single structure like 356. Uh, 356 alone won't do it. So that, I think that's probably the easiest one to characterize is something we keep, keep noting. So maybe we, some more action would be helpful. And as we go along, if I haven't captured your idea here, please let me know if you need more, more language down. I'd be glad to do that. Accelerating too for 356. At least, at least a consideration of accelerating the 356 expansion. I, I don't, I don't know enough about th that particular local effect uh, in combination with the uh, step south 333N. Uh, you know, note, uh, even in COP, uh, you know, with the time annual trail next steps uh, and the, um, uh, um, ba basically we'll be able to raise stages in, in L29, but um, for, and with the road being safe. But will we be able to actually do that uh, and still be protective of uh, the communities to the east of the park? And the answer is probably no, unless we have a better seepage management. We, we won't be able to realize the, the full, our full potential, full potential benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca? I'm just going to support what Dave said because, you know, what he said, because seepage management, we are, because we both want the water to be where the water really should be and where it serves the best purpose. And having it seep east is really not good for the park. It's not good for the communities east of the park. So, you know, if you're not talking structures, you may not realize S-356 is a pump that returns seepage from the L-31 north into the L-29 so it can go back to the park. And that the existing 356 are doing a pretty good job of what they have to deal with now, but if you're going to bring a whole lot more water into the park, you have to have better seepage control or seepage management or seepage barriers in some place. So absolutely, I think seepage management and how to expedite that and accelerate it so that it is there when the water really can be conveyed. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get this gap between projects that want to convey water and give you new water and a system that isn't able to take it. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll come to Bob and then over to Chad. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just, on this issue, I just want to expand it a little bit. If you, if you look at the Central Everglades project, which primarily was focused on sending more water south, and we talk about all the different lines we looked at, the red line for inflows and the blue line for Tamiami Trail, the yellow line for seepage management went north all the way up to the Miami Canal because the transmissivity of the aquifer, you know, increases exponentially when you go south of the Miami Canal. So make sure you consider when you're talking about seepage management we're doing projects to put more water into Water Conservation Area 3B now. And so you need to start dealing with seepage management well north of Tamiami Trail if you're going to have the effects you want, which is returning that water. Uh, SERP, not SEP, had multiple components related to seepage management in 3A, 3B that are not on the IDS now. So I would just say make sure you talk about seepage management over the area where there's an impact, which is larger than just the trail south. We're only talking the trail south because we're putting water in below the trail now, but we're not thinking about what we're doing along the boundary between 3A and 3B, which also has to be managed differently. We'll go to Chad. Hi, uh, Chad Kennedy, DEP. And I guess, Bob, this is kind of a question for you because, you know, we're both kind of in the regulatory world, but in T&E species, um, my perception is right now I've seen some projects that kind of um, and I won't say to be delayed, but it takes um, each one's being more um, the monitoring for each project seems to be doing, being done in an ad hoc kind of a manner by that specific project. And we know a lot of these TNE species travel throughout the region, not just the 16 counties, but at least the 16 counties. And uh, I know at one time there was some discussion about having a um, kind of a comprehensive TNE species monitoring. So it would be kind of like a line item. Every year we're going to do the following monitoring. And that would give U.S. Fish and Wildlife and, of course, FWC and everybody 
some assurances that we're, we're tracking these teeny species throughout the restoration area, not just at over in Pecun Strand, but adjacent to it, we might not be monitoring. That to me seemed like the development of that was happening at one time with the Water Management District, and I think they may have even sent a draft to U.S. Fish and Wildlife about a more comprehensive T&E species monitoring plan instead of having to do it each specific project kind of more in an ad hoc fashion. And I wondered, I'm, I'm asking, do you think that would benefit your agency in being more comfortable with these projects moving forward? And I, I do know at uh, uh, Kissimmee River Restoration, there's just been a few contracts where the actual contractors were literally on site staged and they had to wait for specific um, climate conditions to do um, bonnet head bat surveys and things of that nature, where if we had more of a long-term monitoring, we'd already know if they were present or not. We wouldn't have to ha have these contractors sitting at idle waiting for that data to come in. And it's important data, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm trying to do a more comprehensive look at our T&E species within the restoration area. And I, I'm actually kind of asking uh, your opinion as far as do you think that'd be helpful or? Sure, welcome. So a couple things, Chad. This is Bob Pergolsky, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In, in short, the answer is a, some type of comprehensive monitoring program would be, would be helpful. It, you're talking about over 70 listed species, so it's very, it would be very complex, let's put it that way. Uh, part of our regulatory responsibility are we, we're supposed to be able to definitively say Project X will have this effect on species Y. So in a, in a broad sense, it would be difficult, but we did, we, we're still exploring as an example, uh, some type of, um, I'll kind of, I'm gonna call it a conservation strategy for snail kites. As that's, what, that's the one we're working on right now. Still in the infant stages of how we, how we would accomplish that. That could be tech, uh, potentially a uh, you know, model for the other species, but that's one that we think maybe we can look at it range-wide and not have kites as an, as a, I'll say, as an issue with any of the particular projects. But there would have to be a lot of upfront um, contribution in terms of monitoring uh, on an annual basis because if, let's say, for argument's sake, all of a sudden kites got a disease and you had a huge population drop, whatever concentration strategy we had would have to be flexible enough to, ac to accommodate that so we might have to really change our direction on how we evaluate the, the effects of, of projects as that, if that happens. So in short, the answer would be yes, we, we're looking at more of a, what we call range-wide or recovery strategy for some of these species, but it, it is complicated because each species is a little bit different in terms of how, how it's evaluated, and we have a huge wealth of listed species in this area. Um, but I guess the question, this is rhetorical for the, for the group, is that something that would be a priority for the task force. I, I don't know. You know, they have a, that's a lot of horsepower at, at that level. And um, other than directing agencies to do that, I, I, I'm asking kind of an open-ended question. How would, how would that be uh, laid out as a task force um, priority? Well, that's a good question. And I think that one of the things we're going to do here today is just try to get it all up on the board for us to consider, and then we'll work with our staff at OERI to condense it down and make it a little more usable format and probably bring it back to the group. We'll have one more engagement, correct, before the task force meeting. So we'll probably bring, we could bring it back to the group and further refine it from that point in time. And in, in the interim, work with, Pete, work with folks that, are, that have brought up ideas to answer that question, that exact question. Is, at, is that at the right level for the task force? And do we have it framed appropriately for the Angela? Okay. Bob, why don't you finish on the topic? Uh, Angie Dunn with the Corps of Engineers, maybe to build on a little bit what Bob said and to help frame it for the task force, something that we have to consider with the Corps and our funding is tying the monitoring to a specific project. Um, so something that the task force may be able to help us with when we frame it up is how to make it more of a programmatic type funding SERP in itself was a programmatic study authority, and so there may be a way to tie that back in, but that's something we could ask from the task force. Is that from a funding impact to a core budget? Is that what I'm hearing a, a little bit? Is that what I just heard? Right. So when we get our um, operations and maintenance funding for projects, and that includes our monitoring for endangered species, it's tied to a specific project. So we have to show in our funding request where it's tied to a biological opinion 
um, to be able to, to request and prioritize that funding for the monitoring. And that comes in under the O and M. Yes. With the various 70 species, you never know which one you may have necessarily going into. So how do you apply cost to an overall programmatic budget going into it as opposed to having it as a budget line item that you'll know that specific species or multiple species that you have to monitor for? So, so one of the things we're looking into with this um, conservation plan for the snail kite is on the core end how we would fund that project-wise if we're looking at snail kites throughout the entire system. Um, and so if we we want to move forward to a, to a system-wide monitoring plan for species that are mobile and transient, um, but we have to put together that reasoning and that the logical explanation that falls within our authority and our mission to be able to do so. Nick? Yeah, so I don't know if this would fit in or not, but looking at what the task force was asking for, should we try to identify things where there might be conflicts or disagreements? Mm -hmm. And you know, the one of the things I always really appreciate about this body and the task force is problem solving. You know, we, you know, as a group, we don't really have any authority, but we have an ability to communicate and problem solve. So, are there a list of things currently? I don't know where work discussion is, or I'm just using that as an example. Are there things that we should put on the list to check back in at the next next task force meeting that is that are along the lines of problem solving and moving things forward? I, I don't know if there is. That's just a question certainly if there are it's a good time to get them up on the board for the for the group mm -hmm. Ed? I'm just wondering the extent to which the CISREP group has already identified all of these conflicts kind of outstanding issues that we should refer to that report yeah it's Bob. it's a good comment Bob do you have any well, insights Bob's on comment that? on that <laughs> Mr. Sisrap, any thoughts? Well, I think if you look at their last report, they identify a lot of the, I'll call it, constraints that they see related to moving forward, but they identify them at a big level like storage. You know, we've got a fraction of the storage in plans or construction today versus what we had at the beginning of SERP. And what are the consequences of that? So they do it that way. You know, you've got a proposed project going to move forward you don't have everything you said you start with so what's the consequence of that decision so they approach it that way you know like I said something's changed in your plan in your design how are you going to evaluate the effect so they keep asking us those kind of questions there may be also some issues of time lag until those items come out in a report that may be not maybe more challenging of some near-term items that we need to knock down by say this summer when the CISREP report is not coming out till you know end of the summer maybe the fall so struggling a little bit with the idea that a timeline in a project that started in 1999 and was supposed to take 35 years to complete and here we are um, that that would be a constraint um, and I think that the CISREP report I mean there's been a number of reports and, and a lot of the issues that have been brought up by this very highly qualified group of people they are still issues. They haven't been resolved. They continue to be out there. So I just think that it's something that we've already invested in, in terms of identifying. We might start with the CISREP recommendations of the last three reports or something, weed out the ones that are no longer relevant because they have been resolved, hopefully, and then seeing which of the, I mean, five is not very many big issues to bring up that need to get be resolved and be brought up to the task force level. So I'm just saying that without coming up with a, a bunch of new ideas, they're probably there. And it's really, um, it could be incumbent upon us to really filter to the very top the highest important issues. It's a suggestion um, where, where we might be able to quickly get to a list of five um, vetted issues. So, Alan, uh, um, on our list here, can we um, add to, and maybe you've got it in there, last report identified, because just going back to the CISREP reports and pulling those up um, for future discussions here? I'm, I'm sorry, bringing them up Just again. making sure that we go back to the old CISREP reports that somebody in our office uh, goes back and pulls those um, challenges up from past CISREP mm -hmm. NAS reports. And very appropriate, much like the IDS we were just talking about, builds upon 
year after year work and what's out there right now. The CISERP reports, it's a good opportunity to build upon what they've already laid down, like you said, vetted out very thoroughly. Bob? Uh, once again, Bob Pergolsky, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I wanted to make sure we highlight uh, the big one of what I, I see is one of the big issues is the whole, whole portfolio of invasive species issues. Mm -hmm. It cuts across, Pedro already mentioned it, but it cuts across all the agencies, whether it be fate, state, federal, or local in terms of our management. I think a couple things the task force with that horsepower could help us out with are, is number one, funding. And I, I, I see uh, as an example, if we could, I don't know the process, but if we had some type of interagency funding for a rapid response for whatever species comes on board um, and had a funding source to send out people, uh, resources, whatever, to try to deal with a new species that would be, we talked about the invasion curve, and that would give us at least a head start on some of the other things. Another one I wanted to bring up was our regulatory authorities, because there's both state and, and federal regulatory authorities. We could really use the task force help uh, at that level with uh, uh, amendments to the Lacey Act, revisions mm -hmm. to the Lacey Act, which is a federal authority. I can't speak, to, uh, to obviously, to the state uh, authorities, but FWC and, um, of course, Department of Ag for the, for the plant species, um, whatever the task force could help in terms of bolstering our regulatory authorities um, collectively in terms of the invasive species and, and control and uh, in terms of dealing with importing and uh, species in would be yeah. very helpful. So I see, like I said, two things, funding for some type of standing team of experts that would deal with some new invasion and also helping with uh, the regulatory environment. I know when uh, Secretary Wallace was down, Assistant Secretary Wallace was down uh, for a tour, Rob Wallace, we um, talked to him about being one of the torchbearers for helping us with the Lacey Act revisions based on a you know, court case, uh, court opinion of a couple of years ago, which kind of changed the direction as we saw our authorities under the Lacey Act. So anyway, I think the task force could really help at that level with that kind of group for those two um, aspects of the invasive species portfolio. And then there's a whole, I know we can, we can add a, a number of those, but at any rate, I'd like, thanks. Yeah, certainly we have a number of priorities already identified in the working group, and we do expect there'll be some overlap between, uh, some crosses and overlaps between these these um, action items and the priorities we've identified. So we'll just make sure that the action items are at the right level, meaning that we are, we are approaching invasive species on this group with the, action, uh, the exotic species action framework. That's not the level for the task force, I don't think. That's the level for us to work at. We had a hand up over here. And Jose, we got blank screens up front. Who Dave had his well, hand up. It, 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 it's a, um, I, don't know, I don't know if I'm, I'm challenging you, James, on, on whether, at what level to address this. But um, I, know, I know at least in, DO, in DOI lands, are, oh, we are pressed mm -hmm. for the resources to, man to, to manage exotic species, plants mm -hmm. and animals, and um, use, using the, the, you know, the, this rapid response that's great, but some of the, the problem really is, I think, um, a funding source. And, and I know the pro, one program we have for restoration science support at the park, the CZ program, was, a, you know, it's great year after year, but we're, um, uh, we're, we're spread too thin. It, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's pressure to, to address multiple problems beyond the restoration problems we anticipated, the extent to which we're using it uh, or will be using it for addressing exotics. So having a, co a companion, uh, you know, DOI program, but it could be other, other federal agencies to do do a better job on DOI lands. That alone seems uh, worthwhile. Now maybe that's not a task force um, uh, request, but it, it just seems that it is it is important for for us to succeed. So kind of building off what Dave was saying, I, I, I was thinking something, and it may not rise to the level of this, but I was thinking if we could, thinking about the membership of the task force, the different organizations they represent, would it be something we would want to bring to their priority of, of seeking opportunities for engagement with other groups, other agencies, local governments? Um, I'm thinking just offhand right now we've got Bob, DOI working with 
DOT to do a road raising that was probably never envisioned in SERP. And by doing so, DOT has brought resources to the table that have really expedited the bridge, this road raising project. Are there other opportunities that, that we're missing that could be identified by the task force? There's local governments representation on the task force. There's the tribe representation on the task force. Are there opportunities to engage to not only expedite projects, but avoid any delays in projects? So something, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that, again, if that rises to the task force, or maybe that's just something that we, as the working group, science coordination group, you know, we, we could do, but just a thought, kind of building off what you were saying, Dave. Mm -hmm. I think there's opportunities out there, and we need to identify them. Susan? Dave reminded me and Ed reminded me that um, the Restoration Coordination and Verification Program took a 58 percent cut uh, in 2011. We have not reestablished that level of funding. Um, and it wasn't just the Water Management District and the Corps that suffered from that. A lot of the agencies that would partner with us, task force members, also cut their funding. And I think that in order to effectively illustrate the benefits and the values of what we're trying to do, we need to ask the task force to take a look at what other resources they could bring in to help reestablish, re restore that program. Um, if anything, we have more, while we have probably the same geographic extent, we have more projects in the ground. And the projects are good at focusing on the projects, but even they've been limited. So to get a truly system-wide perspective, we've been uh, hobbled for a long time. <laughs> you, if Dave, you, want, you want to tie things together? Dave, right? your hand went up real quick. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, t tying COP to SEP, uh, tying CISRIP recommendations to where we are now and, and, and how, we, how we follow the best track. You know, this is exactly an example. It does. If, Addressing recovers deficiencies, and there are significant deficiencies, uh, some of which are maybe flaws in the original design, but a lot, I think, ends up being just phys money availability and, and the, the cuts in staff and, and, and capacity. Um, this, this is what we need. CISRIP has hounded us report after report for being too reductionist geographically, topically, uh, we're not integrative. We're supposed to be system-wide integrative in nature, uh, addressing the, the system ecosystems problems. And uh, recover the, this vul the vulnerability modeling and, uh, project that I mentioned is an effort to um, at least address that in part. Uh, but that, that's a recover project. Uh, it's uh, you know, the time estimate. Um, I got from one of the CISRA members was, you're kidding about two or three years doing this, right? You know, this is more like at the level, at the rate you're going, it'll be 10 years. Um, it's like, you know, that might be right. Um, do we need it now? Yeah, we do. Uh, or something similar. So I think, um, S Susan, in, in your, your last meeting, I don't know that anything would be more appropriate to to uh, introduce as a, as a proposal than, than trying to um, make recover whole and effective. Thank you. Dave, you brought up linkages and tying things together, and we've heard that same theme a couple of times, not only going around the table with the 344 and the 356, those two control structures. We heard it with combined operations plan and Central Everglades project. We heard it with the EAA and the flow capacities. So I think that, that might be something that we should think about as a group, just being able to point out where, you know, one step is so integral to that second step. So the task force members are all paged up on that. Um, so they understand those linkages, how important that step of the component is to the next one. Yeah. Can, can I add an example for recover? Re to look system-wide is so important. So the, 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 lo, the loathsome analysis, which is not, not SERP, but um, that's going to be critical for 
Lake Okeechobee's own the ecological status of, of the lake and the local economy and the Okeechobee Basin. But, it, but its impact extends way beyond that. You know, our, our uh, water availability for, for the southern portion of the system too is influenced. So I think that, that is built into the Lowsome analysis, but it needs to be taken seriously. And, it's, and Recover as an organization really was, um, the vision was to, that it could deal with that kind of analysis. So uh, just one example. I'm going to let the awkward silence sit for a minute while people are thinking. So I think we've captured a lot up there. Maybe not as many pages on the IDS, but we have certainly more than five <laughs> things to think about, I think. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. Um, and one, one thing that will be remiss is that as we distill these and bring them back to the group, we have to be cognizant and consider what we already have venues and pathways to bring things to the task force, such as project updates and construction updates and timelines are all very important for the task force to be tracking, and they are tracking them. The core and the district provide comprehensive updates on those things right now. So that's certainly something that the task force is tracking and needs to track, and they're getting it through their updates. So we're going to, as we work these out and distill this down, we're going to have to consider how those other projects fit in, like you said earlier, Adam, and how these new ones come in. Because if we come in with five independent presentations, that's going to fill the entire agenda for the meeting. Mm -hmm. Chris? Kind of been reluctant to raise this because I'm not sure this is the right level, or, but it strikes me as, as we're sitting here hearing about all this progress, progress on construction that we need to really spend some time as a science coordination group, and working group, thinking about how we're going to assess progress mm -hmm. on the ground. We have system-wide indicators, but they've been developed to kind of s assess the overall ecosystem status. And actually, now that we're doing things, we might need to rethink how we're, how we're mathematically calculating some of them and things of that nature. So. Um, it's kind of separate from rethinking the indicators. It's kind of rethinking assessment of progress towards restoration rather than just construction projects on the ground. All right, I think we can close this discussion on uh, the progress on the ground for projects and considering that. Um, certainly an important topic, topic. Marking the success is one of those things that has um, potential, one of those things that contributed to bringing in a discussion of the ecological indicators. I think it's certainly coming into the conversation of the ecological indicators. So We'll be coming back to the group with this and with the help of the staff over at OERI. Thank you very much. I'm going to thank them right now because I know there's going to be work outside the room on that. Uh, we have a public comment. I've got to get it right now. i got a note to hit it right now. <laughs> I skipped over my minutes earlier and Nick, Nick was kind enough to remind me. Um, we got a public comment period coming up and we'll take it right after we uh, consider the minutes from the last meeting. So I look for a motion to, to move. we have a motion to move. We have a second on the motion to accept second. the minutes. We have a second on the motion to accept the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All against? Okay. Accepted. Thank you. For public comment in the afternoon, I have, I have one card here, Drew Martin. Do I see it? Drew, why don't you, the podium is on for you. Uh, Drew Martin, I'm here on behalf of the Loxatcher Group of the Sierra Club, and I want to thank everybody for all their work. And uh, I just want to kind of <clears throat> reemphasize what actually Chris just said, and that is uh, the goal really needs to be how much we're accomplishing the restoration and not how many projects or how much money we're spending. And I think that is what the public is looking for. And so obviously, in order to manage projects, you have to have a goal to get projects done, and you have to have a goal, and you have to have a budget, so that's completely understandable. 
but I think it would be nice to have something in parallel that said uh, we've reduced outflows to the estuaries by 25%. So in other words, our milestone is in, at the end of five years, we're going to see that accomplished. Irregardless of what projects you do, because from time to time, you may shuffle the projects around. You may find that a different project might be more valuable. Uh, the mention of like the uh, project stopping the uh, seepage. So it would be nice so that at, at, when you put your goals on the table that you say X number of exotic species, and maybe you're already doing this, X number of exotic species when we reach this goal will be reduced. Certain, this amount of water will no longer flow out to the estuaries, but will flow south to Everglades National Park, this amount of quality water. And if you've already done it, I know you do a lot of that already, but it might be nice in this process to parallel these goals with those accomplishments, because then when you go out to the public and you ask for money, you're more likely to get it when you can show that you've reduced the amount of outflow to the estuaries. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. So, Adam, would you like to take us into the next steps or some closing remarks today? And I'll turn to all my co-chairs for that. And so again, I thank everybody for your time today. I hope you found it to be uh, as constructive as I did. There are some um, actionable items I think that you can take to the task force and that in addition to what we have reviewed today um, we'll get another blush another swipe at this coming up there could be new additions new topics that you think of I know that this is the first time you may have considered this or listened to others um, and as you consider your own resource or your own area where those conflicts with your neighbors or your partners are at um, we really need to get to these and root them out and, and start to break them down. Um, so I appreciate the Corps' opportunity to work with the IDS and their support of this and the district um, for providing the room here today again as the uh, auditorium for all things ecosystem restoration for at least my <laughs> office. Um, without this kind of a facility, we tried to stuff 40 people into my office and it almost didn't work. Um, so uh, we, we, you know, further, further provides the, the, the support. And thank you, Jennifer and Drew and, and others here at the district um, and the taxpayers for supporting this. Um, the, uh, the next meeting that we have on our docket at this particular time is February 25th. The one after that is June 23rd that we have um, that's scheduled for here at the, uh, the Water Management District. Um, Again, to repeat it, the next task force meeting is being looked at for, um, I'm waiting to hear back from the chair and the vice chair, again, August 21st, 20, uh, April 21st, 22nd, or the first week of May, um, to, to reiterate that. Um, I don't really have much in the way, thanking OERI staff that are here today. Um, they're working behind the scenes at all times, uh, providing this, making adjustments, changing, uh, setting up the venue, reporting on all of uh, the reports that Kevin spoke about. Um, it is a, a lot of work that keeps them constantly busy. Um, we hope to be in the next couple of months, we're revamping the uh, OERI website to make it more user friendly, make it more current and new, uh, working on those components. Um, and um, so I appreciate everybody. Uh, Kevin, do you have anything to add? No? Okay. All right. James, that's basically uh, the housekeeping that I had uh, on notes from this uh, meeting. Thank you, Adam. And, and I, too, would send a thank you to the to OERI for their support in between meetings. There's a lot of conversation between meetings, and all of our team members here are, are very open and discussive on the topic. So thank you very much. Let's keep that up as we go on. And uh, thanks to the state and federal partners for what they're going to look at on the IDS. It's no small feat to try to make a distilled version of the IDS. Um, and on that, in terms of announcements, I will announce that we have a – I will announce that uh, the FWC has a commission meeting happening December 10th and – December 11th and 12th in Pensacola, Florida. Um, the full agenda for that is online, is on the on our website. If anyone is interested, I'll turn to our chairs for some 
remarks before we close the meeting? Okay. Susan? I just wanted to thank everybody again for the nice comments. And to, um, although Nick was hoping that I was going to announce that drinks were on me, that's not what I was going to add right now. Um, but that uh, for those that have my cell phone number, the number's staying the same. And if you would like it, I'd be happy to give it to you and stay in touch. Thank you. Kim? Please. I just want to point out that a lot of the discussion we had about how do we assess restoration progress on the ground are just the kind of topics we need to integrate into this review of the ecological indicators that we're doing. So think about those topics because we're going to reach out to you between now and February about who can assist in this process. Like I said, this is a, this is a task force working group, uh, science coordination group effort. We've got to make sure that we fix any problems in the current indicators and we make them as robust as possible for our future reports. This is our task to do. So anticipate we're going to reach out and try to get some steering committee members to start working on this. All right. Thank you. And with that, thank you all for coming and I'll call the meeting adjourned. Mm -hmm.